Talk about a funny thing that happened when you were young. Talk about your grandparents. Talk about where you lived. Talk about what you did outside and what books you loved. Find ways to read, write, and tell stories together. This is Barbara Peterson from the Albuquerque Public Schools Board of Education. APS Community Connection, presented by KANW. The APS Community Connection. There are simple things you can do at home to help your child read, learn, and succeed. Talk, sing, and breathe together. Find rhyming words. Read signs as you go. Josh. Yolanda. Yes. Yeah. 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 Is she doing a practice? Is she teaching also? Not yet, but she wants to. She wants to, so hopefully that will happen. I mean, she'd like to teach at, I mean, she would like to teach like high school, but they don't allow them to. Oh, wow. So she's she going to, uh, so she's going to either end up going to teaching at like UNM or at the medical school or... I'm always stealing the pens. <laughs> I am the culprit. You are the culprit? I am the culprit. And then I wonder why I have so many pens in my purse. <laughs> Go home with Actually, it's because I carry two or three pens in my pocket. Anyway, so I look and I've got none in my pocket. So I know, like it's... Anyway, you know? Yeah, like and some days... some more, you know, and then yeah. I lose them again. Exactly. So how was your day going? Well, it's okay. We had a busy one. We had a conference going on for a couple of days. Really? Yeah, with all of our placements. Oh, really? We had them here for today and tomorrow. So that's where I I had a meeting with Amy Melazo and, and Madeline about the CTE stuff because, you know, when we met, I kind of said, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll get kind of a draft by, we'll get a draft by late August and we'll come back. And, well, I kind of had in mind kind of a, a general kind of a draft, get people together, talk about it. And of course, when I inquired about this in mid August, I was like, oh,
gonna go to the open house tomorrow for Tres Volcanes. Yeah. Yeah. So do you try not to leave her? Leave her alone too much? Yeah. Oh, good. Nephew Patrick, he's the oldest grandson. Yeah. And very white, very able <coughs> looking. Uh, you know, like me. They need to know. And basically, he, uh, he has light hair. But but we're, we could be in the four or five of you. But he's teaching Spanish. There's nobody else around here. Exactly. We could help people. I don't know. We get somebody to collaborate. My wife said, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> We're starting to quiet down. That's good. I know. I think they want us to. Be, they want us to get they started. They want us to get started. <laughs> I'd like to call to order the board of meeting, uh, the board of education meeting, uh, for uh, whatever this date is, September nineteenth, at uh, five o four, and uh, we have a little announcement here from Sonia on our on interpretation. Sí, buenas tardes. Si alguien necesita interpretación al español, me avisa y les puedo alcanzar un receptor de interpretación. Gracias. Thank you, Sonia. And uh, I have the wonderful uh, privilege here of having my, uh, I say my, uh, uh, La Cueva principal, Dana Lee, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So if everybody would please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, you may be seated. I'd like to have a moment of silence uh, in honor of all the APS graduates who have lost their lives while serving our country. Thank you. I'd like to have a roll call, please. Peggy Milan Aragon. Here. Lorenzo Garcia. Here. Yolanda Montoya Cordova. Here. Barbara Peterson. Candelaria Patterson. Here. Elizabeth Armijo. Here. Dr. David Piercy. Here. Um, I'd like to have a motion to adopt the September 19, 2018 Board of Education meeting agenda and approval of the September 5th Board of Education meeting minutes. And uh, also, we uh, have had a request to move item 7C6 off the consent item just for a separate vote. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, thank you. Uh, we'll go on to uh, recognition of staff and community students. Uh, board member Montoya Cordova. Welcome to tonight's board meeting and thank you for coming. Our first recognition will be, uh, will be a presentation by Ms. Amanda Short. 
The short was a Fulbright Distinguished Scholarship Award recipient and spent five months in New Zealand examining the integration of indigenous pedagogy and curriculum in diverse classrooms for underserved student populations. She's going to share a brief presentation about her experiences with us. So Ms. Short, would you please come to the podium? Imagine yourself in fourth grade. How exciting would your world be, no matter your ethnicity, your income, or your language? The knowledge that your culture brings is seen as an asset and not a hurdle. This is what I was imagining as I set out on a five-month sabbatical in New Zealand as a Fulbright teacher, with a focus on creating culturally responsive pedagogy and curriculum. New Zealand may be halfway around the globe, but there are many similarities between New Zealand and New Mexico. Both have deep-rooted cultures, the story of colonization, and both are multilingual. So I went to New Zealand to try to answer these two questions. What does a culturally rich and responsive indigenous education and pedagogy look like? And how do non-indigenous teachers best serve indigenous students? So I would like to tell just a few stories from my travels that I believe will explain how I found a few answers to these questions. Um, first, community was important in New Zealand schools. Often schools had a variety of community members working with them. It was common to see a mom with her baby or toddler at the school helping out. In the picture at the top, you can see a grandma is helping a kid roll across the playground in a plastic barrel. I also had the opportunity to attend an event called Tough Guys and Gals. To set the stage, this was a cold fall day. I was wearing hat, gloves, and winter coat. And the school event had students of all ages running through the mud, under brush, tires, climbing over walls, through barbed wire. What was so impressive is that students worked as a team. This wasn't about winning, but it was about helping your schoolmates finish the race. In one picture, you'll notice the girl is turned looking back. She's checking on her classmates to see if they're OK. In another picture, you'll see a girl on the bank. She's too scared to cross, so one of her schoolmates goes back and helps her across the cold water filled with eels. This strong sense of community was key to New Zealand's culturally responsive education. People's lives weren't as segmented. Rather, the school was the hub of the community, and everyone was responsible for everyone else. Additionally, it was just so refreshing to see kids being kids, which brings me to my next theme, risk-taking. Students were encouraged to take risks. They were allowed to fail. They were allowed to take ownership in their learning. Pictured here, you see a learning through play station for kindergartners. This was complete with a real pliers and screwdriver. The teachers were unafraid of injury. They wanted their kids to explore and develop. In the next picture, students are experimenting with a paper propeller for science, and they're standing on their desks to do so. Pictured below that are students at recess enjoying climbing in an old tree. And lastly, this discussion topics from elementary parent-teacher student conferences that focused on student learning and taking ownership. I wonder how have we gotten so far away from this in New Mexico education? What can we do to move our education system back to embracing risk-taking and learning through failure instead of deficit model thinking? Lastly, these pictures are from a rural school visit. The students at the school totaled 25. The teachers were hardworking and knowledgeable, and they came from their community and worked with their community. When outsiders from the Ministry of Education came to offer help, the teachers would tell them that they didn't need any help. Everything was fine, even though this was one of the highest poverty schools that I visited. The teachers knew that the ministry had its own idea of what help looked like. They knew that the ministry didn't see how rich the people of this community were. The people didn't have big paychecks. 
but they worked off the land and owned their own homes, and they would come to the school to help out when needed. When I was there, uncles and dads were helping students perform a hangi, which is a traditional meal of vegetables and meat roasted in the ground. Culturally responsive education comes from the community, and it sees the community as a rich asset. It doesn't measure the deficits of children and their families. So I ask you again to think about the fourth grade you. What kind of education would you like to have? One where deficits are exploited? Or one where diversity is an asset? Are you willing to help work for change? And I have a little time if there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Um, Amanda, please come up to the, I'd like to recognize you. Great. That's awesome. Our next recognition will be introduced by Associate Superintendents Dr. Gabrielle Blakey, Dr. Antonio Gonzalez, Ms. Yvonne Garcia, and Mr. Troy Hughes. Good evening. Tonight we have the honor of recognizing new principals in APS and principals who are also new to their schools. As principals, and as you know, they are expected to be flexible since every day brings different joys and challenges. They also wear many hats, such as being exceptional leaders, problem solvers, listeners, activists, teachers, trainers, cheerleaders, managers, visionaries, and mentors. All of this while they try to respond to emergencies and their individual school needs. And they get to work with us, which is probably the hardest part about their job. Um, we are very thankful for the principals who are new to APS and are new to their schools this year. We would like to call you all up to be recognized. As we call your name, will you please come up to the podium? We will begin with zone one. I won't say anything about it, but it's the best one. Um, <laughs> zone one, new principal at Albuquerque High School. Coming from Ernie Pyle Middle School is Ryan Homestek. At Coronado Elementary School, Nathaniel Custer. East San Jose Elementary School, hot off the press, um, Edder Ortiz. Eugene Field Elementary School, Veronica Nolan. Jefferson Middle School, Monica Olmsted. Manzano Mesa Elementary School, um, coming to us as a principal from Rio Rancho um, Public Schools, is Brian Garcia. Mark, Mark Twain Elementary School, Doreen Trotz. And McCollum Elementary School is Gabrielle Miller.
And it is my honor to introduce the new principals from Zone 2. Armijo Elementary School, Modesta Hernandez. <laughs> Ernie Pyle Middle School, Stacia Duarte. <laughs> John Adams Middle School, Ken Merhedge. <laughs> Coming from the Las Cruces School District, Navajo Elementary School, Principal Sarah Garcia. And all the way from the state of Tennessee, our new Painted Sky Elementary School Principal, Sally Odin. And from Zone 3, and we don't have to say that we're the best, because we know. Um, unable to join us tonight is Corrales Elementary School Principal, Liv baca Hockhalzer. Coyote Willy, Willow Family Magnet School, Adrian Lytle. E Academy Magnet High School, Shell Marie Harris. MacArthur Elementary School, Fred March. Sierra Vista Elementary School, Jacqueline Bogue. And representing the entire zone for the new principals is Christina Perea from Petroglyph Elementary. <laughs> I will stay out of the banter that zone four is the best and we save the best for the last, but we will we'll let that go. So here we go. Zone four. We have Bel Air Elementary Susie Palmer. <laughs> out of Cleveland Middle School, we have Marisol Fraga. <laughs> Venice Chavez Elementary, we have Jessica Chavez. You're gonna like that we match the names of the principals to the schools that they go to. So that was uh, that was good, and she replaced the Jessica, so she was Jessica 2.0. So that was uh, that was a good thing. Desert Willow Family Magnet School is Trish Ann Teasdale. George O'Keefe Elementary is Jessica Owen. And Sombre del Monte Elementary School is Miss Jennifer Peak. We want to thank everyone for all their support uh, to our parents and our community and our family and everyone who comes into this profession uh, as it is a huge sacrifice uh, for them but the opportunity to lead and we want to let them know how much we appreciate them and all their efforts that they put forth in educating our children here in Albuquerque Public Schools. So if everyone can please give a round of applause as we recognize <laughs> our family.
Oh, he's in here. No. That's phone call. Oh, right. Right. Our next, our next recognition will be introduced by Associate Superintendent of Zone 4, Troy Hughes. All right, just one clarification. All principals, after you've received your award, uh, they are gonna take photos of you guys out by the trophy case. Uh, so we'll have a before and after photo of what you look like <laughs> at the end of the year versus uh, the start. So everybody's smiling and happy now. Right. They'll be smiling and happy later, right? <laughs> I'm just gonna wait until we get the, the first wave out and then we'll recognize and give honor to our, our next recipient. I love that. All right. Tonight, we have the honor of recognizing an exceptional Albuquerque Public High School coach. Miss Ashcraft was recently named Coach of the Year by the National High School Athletic Coaches Association. To receive this prestigious award, the recipient must show a strong dedication to supporting and developing high school student athletes. They must be highly successful high school coaches in their sports and place value on the teamwork skills their players learn for success in the classroom and on the field. Miss Ashcraft has been the La Cueva Bears soccer coach for 20 seasons and has led the La Cueva girls to eight state titles. Eight state <laughs> titles, absolutely remarkable. With 386 victories, she will be in line to reach the 400 win plateau this season. Miss Ashcraft, would you please come to the podium? You guys can clap, this is pretty amazing. <laughs> would the family and friends of Miss Ashcraft uh, and administration, would you please rise to be recognized? Ms. Ashcraft, thank you very much for all the ways you encourage our students to be their best and the amount of time and sacrifice that you put in to making La Cueva Soccer an amazing program that you have established. Thank you very much. shenanigans going on here. <laughs> she, she played at La Cueva. <laughs> She's a sophomore from Mike Brown. <laughs> <laughs> Our next recognition will be introduced by um, Mr. Hughes, El Dorado's go. basketball. <laughs> So this, this has a little personal story that kind of goes with it here. Uh, Roy Sanchez uh, took me on as an assistant coach, <laughs> and this was the first thing I got when I became the assistant coach at El Dorado uh, basketball was this lovely uh, Texas orange, and I still fit in it. That's, that's the amazing thing. I don't, I don't know how much tighter I can shrink it down a little bit, but uh, I, I haven't got a lot of swag. And I do have to tell La Cueva High School that I did receive an awesome La Cueva shirt uh, the other day as well. So I will represent La Cueva as well. Congratulations. But th there's a, there is a personal connection here uh, to our next recipient, and he would not have it any other way, I'm sure, than me wearing Texas orange for this one. So 
Anyways, tonight we have the honor of recognizing another extraordinary APS coach, Roy Sanchez, El Dorado High School boys basketball coach and athletic director, was recently named the New Mexico to the New Mexico High School Coaches Association Hall of Fame. Mr. Sanchez has proven himself in the last quarter century to be one of New Mexico's greatest basketball coaches. Mr. Sanchez began coaching at El Dorado in 1985 as a junior varsity basketball and junior varsity soccer coach. He coached all-star teams in 1989, 2004, and 2013. He was named the APS Coach of the Year in 2004, Metro Coach of the Year in 2000 and 2004, and the New Mexico Coach of the Year in 2004. Under his leadership, the El Dorado boys basketball team has won three state titles, been to the Final Four eight times, won seven district championships, and won four Metro championships. This season, he'll likely be able to reach the 400 win plateau. Mr. Sanchez, would you please come to the podium? Personal side notes going off script here. Roy Sanchez has been a fantastic influence on many, many families and students uh, and athletes and everything that he has put his heart and soul into and the commitment that his family has made to support El Dorado uh, is truly remarkable. So uh, people, families and friends, would you please uh, rise to be recognized for your sacrifices that you've made? And Coach Sanchez, thank you very much for your service of being an outstanding coach and role model to all our student athletes. Can we have some recognition for Mr. Sanchez? So, so Troy, apparently you didn't make it as assistant coach. Is that what we're, do we get that out of this or? I, I, I would like to point that out that, uh, <laughs> no, Roy wasn't going anywhere, so I had to make another decision. Final recognition will be introduced by the Executive Director of the Student, Parent, and Employee <laughs> Service Center, uh, Shelley Green. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Montoya Cordova, members of the board, Superintendent Reedy. Tonight we have the honor of recognizing an exemplary department. The Student, Parent, and Employee Service Center addresses questions, concerns, and complaints from students, parents, families, employees, and community members. Some of our topics include general district information, parking lots, conferences, HVAC, transfers, grades, boundaries, custody issues, GED, homeschooling, schedule changes, student discipline or not student discipline, um, policies, procedural directives, CYFD information, and volunteers, to name a few. Sometimes we also receive some very interesting calls, uh, such as um, when it is when we, one time when we had snow predicted, but there was no, no snow on the ground, there was no snow falling, uh, we had one of our high schools whose students decided maybe if they started calling the district during their lunch hour, we might cancel school. So that day we got about 25 calls from various students, all from the same high school. Um, occasionally we received calls for the Atlanta Public Schools, Alamogordo Public Schools, Arizona Public Service. <laughs> it, it, we get quite a variety. Um, transfers right now um, have slowed down quite a bit. We uh, will continue doing transfers for this school year all the way through May, but up to this point, we have processed about 750, excuse me, 7,500 requests, 
And of those, about 4,700 students have been placed in their school of choice. So that takes up quite a bit of time. Uh, the service center also oversees district um, discipline hearings, um, and those are run about 450 per year. And in the midst of all this hard work and our service-focused conversations, we also have some very memorable calls that are very touching. Um, we have one call that um, will always stand out to me. A third grader, third grader called us on his own because he was concerned that the lunch detention he had been assigned at school was going to affect his opportunity to go to college. Um, so it, 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 is, can, it can be very bittersweet sometimes. Um, as I call your name, will you please come and stand to my left? James Apodaca is our hearing officer caseworker, and unfortunately he could not be here with us tonight. Anya Barr is one of our specialists, and she is on maternity leave. Debbie Chavez, specialist. Leah Guterres, administrator. Marcella Jones, administrator. Dr. Nell New, who is one of our administrators, also could not be here this evening. Many of you, I think, know Dr. New. She's been serving the district for I think close to 50 years. Uh, Paul Pickerel, specialist. Keena Richardson, our new hearing officer. And John Rodriguez, our student transfer secretary. Would the family and friends of these exemplary staff members please stand so that we can greet you? Staff, thank you for all the ways you go above and beyond to answer questions, research situations, be patient, resolve issues at all level, and help our APS community. And personally, I have to say, I uh, can't imagine working with a, a better group of people that are as dedicated as these folks are. Let's show our appreciation for this group. So that concludes our recognitions. Congratulations again to everyone and thank you for joining us tonight. We're now going to begin public forum. <clears throat> so whether you are here with the requests for the Board of Education to consider, provide information, or just see how the Board of Education operates, we want you to know that you are welcome. The Board of Education has established rules for expected civil behavior during the meeting and public forum. Upon signing in to speak tonight, you received a signature form and copy of the procedural directive which outline those rules for expected behavior. The presiding officer will enforce these rules as appropriate throughout the meeting. There are, I forgot to look at that, there are eight speakers. Therefore, to accommodate the greatest number of speakers, each speaker has two minutes for comments within the 30-minute public forum. The time remaining to speak will appear on the screen in front of you. You may not yield your unused time to another speaker. You are always welcome to submit additional comments to the board in writing if you are unable to convey your message or you are not able to speak within the 30-minute public forum. 
The Board of Education encourages you to stay for the entirety of the meeting so you may listen to the board members' comments before we adjourn. And only at this time may your concerns be addressed at the discretion of each board member. Uh, so the first, I'm going to call up the first three speakers. Um, you guys could just line up here at the podium. Uh, Franklin Ghana, Ooh, Shraddha Patel, I hope I may have messed that up, uh, and Janet Sayers. President Piercy, members of the board, Superintendent Reedy. My name is Franklin Gauna. I work at Montezuma Elementary School. I've been there since 2010. I want to know why enrollment is dropping and then picking up and then dropping again. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, at the lowest point, Montezuma, I think, had like 140. Uh, in enrollment of students. Um, this was in, I think, 2015, 2016. At the end of 2016, we lost about 22 teachers. Um, and then it rose back up again. Um, and now uh, we're in 2018, and the enrollment is um, 400. Um, We've gone through seven administrators from my time when I got there in 2010 to current. Um, I think it's because of the way that teachers are evaluated through the state of New Mexico. And we're losing um, nationally board certified teachers by the droves, not, not specifically in that location, but that location is hit it hard. It's because your disconnect uh, to the buildings, both board members and superintendents, and um, the trainings that you put your principals through. I think I saw my principal today for maybe five minutes before he had to go off in the afternoon for training. Um, they're not there to, 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 um, to support a building. They're constantly at trainings. So you're losing experienced um, administrators to not administrative work. You have to figure this out and quickly. You're losing your, um, your teachers to other states. Patel? Hi. Uh, my name is Shraddha Patel. I'm here to encourage uh, y'all to vote no on the resolution for APS to create its own standalone police department. Um, school security is an important issue all across the country, and especially including um, Albuquerque Public Schools, but this is not the solution. The creation, the creation of a standalone police department wouldn't make schools safer for students of color or for any student for that matter. The APS had released uh, data a few years ago around the, um, on different districts on the number of suspension, expulsions, and referrals for police, um, which showed that Native American students, African American students, and Latino students were just disproportionately impacted and referred for arrest in schools in this district. And these are my friends. These are people that are like my brothers, my sisters. These are people that I know. Right? They would dis I grew up with, with students disappearing, right? and I wouldn't see them for a few years. Right? They'd pop back up, and they would tell me horror stories. They would tell me that they're, they're further pushed into the margins. This police department is not a solution to help keep students in school, to help students um, have support in school. Right? Um, creating this will further marginalize students who are already targeted, as this report showed. They are further targeted, and it will push them, especially students of color, into um, the school to prison pipeline. Um, when their students are safest, when they're in a supportive environment, there are many other options for you guys to look into to create that environment. Um, this includes having professionals who know how to intervene in student crises, who are trained in restorative justice practices, right? Um, 
APS schools work to align and train their current school police into these practices and focus on advocating for resources for more social workers, for more counselors, for trained mental health workers, um, instead of more police, right? Our schools need support and they need people to feel safe. These two institutions don't have a need to be under the same head, right? We have a need for more student support and I really encourage you guys to vote no on this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening, Madam Superintendent, uh, President Piercy, members of the board, and esteemed, esteemed staff of APS. Uh, yes, I'm bringing another report about Del Norte High School and Hodgen Elementary, but I, um, first of all, I did want to express appreciation for the board looking at the policy to extend public comment to 45 minutes, because I know uh, there are times when there are many, many people wanting to speak. Uh, second. As always, I'm glad to be here tonight because I was not aware there was a new principal at Cleveland and Bel Air, and I was able to make a quick connection with them outside, so that was good. Uh, I wanted to report that on Friday night, September the 7th, uh, we had a fundraiser for Del Norte Scholarships. It was the Ballet Folklorico, which were students who had been at Del Norte in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, and we were able to raise, well, they were the dancers, and uh, they were able to raise uh, $2,600. So we're well on our way to uh, our scholarship goals. Uh, lastly, Hodgen, yes, we'll celebrate 60 years on Saturday, and I believe board member uh, Garcia is able to come and board member Muller Aragon, uh, possibly, and everyone is very much invited. Uh, we're looking forward to um, hearing from Rose Dixon, who was a longtime Hodgen principal. She's going to be one of our speakers. Ron Angel, whose mother was Tony Angel, who was uh, Hodgen's very first principal in a barrack school on the grounds of Bel Air uh, from 1956 on. And then Hodgen opened in uh, 1958. We're all, we also have some new partners with the Evangel Church. They're helping us with refreshments. And the Hodgen Neighborhood Association is doing some things. And very quickly, this is my report card from Bel Air that my teacher signed in 1958 that sent me on to Hodgen as a fifth grader. And I will share some choice comments that she made about my uh, study habits at a later time. <laughs> Thank you. The next three speakers, uh, Zachary Fort, Emma Jones, mm -hmm. and Jeremy, is it Gill? Okay. Just going to wait. Uh, Madam Secretary, President Percy, members of the board. My name is Zach Fort. I'm the president of the New Mexico Shooting Sports Association. We are the state affiliate of the NRA for New Mexico. But I'm here today to speak about the school safety resolution. And I, and I want to begin by saying, you know, I support most of the items in this resolution. School safety is a very pressing issue right now. In fact, just today in Albuquerque, there was a bomb threat made at CNM Montoya campus. So I want to, I want to thank you for addressing this issue with this resolution. Uh, for school safety. But there is some specific language in the resolution that I want to bring to your attention that I do not believe would be an effective measure to make our school safer. That, that language specifically is related to what is known as universal background checks. Um, this exact law that this school safety resolution supports was introduced in the Mexico legislature in 2017. However, the New Mexico Sheriff's Association in 2017 signed a letter which had this to say about that law. This proposed gun control law would not, step, would not stop criminals from getting their guns from other criminal associates as they already do. These bills are literally unenforceable by law enforcement. Now this law that, that the school safety resolution supports, universal background checks, was implemented in the state of Colorado in 2013. A recent study done by John Hopkins University's Center for Public Health um, about the Colorado's implementation of the law found that there was no there's no impact on crime or even the number of background checks performed as a result of this law passing. The attributed 
that result to non-compliance with the law, which is exactly what our sheriffs predicted. So I'd encourage you to pass this resolution, but striking the language supporting universal background checks. Thank you for your time. Emma? Board President Piercy, um, members of the board, thank you for having me today. My name is Emma Jones. I work with Learning Alliance of New Mexico. Um, I'm a longtime member of the Families United for Education. We helped write the family engagement policy, which board member Peterson was also a part of helping to write. Um, I'm here today in opposition of the proposed um, standalone police department. Um, Resolution that is on specifically because um, as a member of Families United for Education and, and who's been actively involved in helping to write that, that language, I do not believe that the four elements of the family engagement policy would be upholded if we will try to create a standalone police department. Specifically, the first one is fostering safe and welcoming environments. I do not believe in my heart of hearts that all students feel safe with more police officers on school campuses, particularly young people of color. Um, inside of our community and particularly families who are undocumented and mixed status, um, they would feel a lot more uncomfortable coming on school campus and engaging in, in any kind of fam familiar way, um, both as a student and as a parent, if they're not sure if they're gonna be arrested or targeted by police while they're on campus. Um, as a parent, I also know this all too well, from those of you who don't know, I actually have a son who's inside the, the fifth grade at Reginald Chavez Elementary School. This year I had a problem. Um, he has a disability, he has irritable bowel syndrome, and the police had to forcefully remove him from the restroom for taking too long. As a parent, it was not only a nightmare for me, it was a nightmare for my child. And I know for a fact that it makes a very hostile working environment for him as a young person, and makes me feel really uncomfortable wanting to come, come to the school when I know that our schools are over-policed, pushing the students into the school to prison pipeline, and not creating safe and welcoming spaces for our families and for our community to engage in. So I please urge you to um, really think about this and think about what are the impacts on our families. Um, and really, if you would like to consider allowing for more public input on this process, I know there has there was talks about having a forum on school safety, and I don't believe that that's happened yet. So before voting on this, I would respectfully ask that you look into having dialogue more with the community about what are other alternatives and solutions to school safety as opposed to creating a standalone police department. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jeremy? I'd like to I'd like to thank the members of the board for taking the time to, to hear us today. Um, Jeremy Gill, I'm the owner and lead instructor of practical defense training and the vice president of the New Mexico Shooting Sports Association. I'm here to speak in, uh, I guess, somewhat support and opposition of the school safety resolution. Uh, like Zach, I, I support the majority of that school safety resolution, but I would ask that you strike the verbiage for universal background checks from that. Um, and if we're looking at a school safety standpoint, the universal background checks uh, will create a a polarizing political debate that I don't feel is in the best interest of our students or the members of the board. Um, I think there are resolutions, there are things that we can look to other states, Ohio and Colorado, things that they have in place to increase the level of safety and security that those school children have that we could look at possibly adopting um, within the current constructs of the laws that we already have in place. Um, and I know New Mexico Shooting Sports Association, as well as myself and other, other um, you know, personal safety instructors or firearms instructors would love to have a conversation with the school board on what we can do to, to actually save lives. When we're looking at school safety resolution, the universal background checks, I'm inclined to believe that that verbiage is in there um, for the unlikely tragic event of, a, of an active shooter at one of our schools, right? Our school aged children can't pass background checks as it is, so we're looking at an adult um, aged actor. Uh, so some things that we could put in place with the laws that are currently on the books that would not um, inflate the budget or the financial requirements of uh, Albuquerque Public Schools um, that we have seen uh, be successful in Colorado, for example, in Ohio, for example, some states that have some great training requirements and programs in place um, to, to, make our, to ultimately make our schools uh, safer. safer. Thank you. Thank you. And our final two speakers, uh, Isaiah Moya, and Isabella Baker. Hello, board members. Uh, my name is Isaiah Moya. I'm the leadership coordinator 
for Together for Brothers. We're a community that brings young men of color together and tries to lead them in a different path that young men of color don't know or they aren't really shown to. But Together for Brothers asked you, um, no, sorry. Together for Brothers asked our youth leaders, current and former APS students, who voiced their strong feelings against an APS police force. Young men of color are disproportionately negatively impacted by disciplined, by disciplined policies and law enforcement in and out of schools. Young men of color are criminalized by truancy and classroom behavior pro policies, especially zero tolerance policies. Undocumented immigrant, refugee families, and other families of color, especially Native Americans, are also intimidated by law enforcement in school and the community, possibly even excluding their participation. Together for Brothers stands with our community partners against the resolution or request that or request to have APS develop their own official police force. We urge APS to reconsider a police force and instead invest in restorative justice policies and practices and other preventative strategies that value students and their families. As part of the solution and partners in making, in making all of our schools safe spaces. Young men of color are, can, and should be leaders at all levels of the, in their communities. And the official APS police force doesn't help us to achieve our goals of healthy and successful lives for young men of color and their families. So yeah, we strongly um, ask you guys to reconsider and look into other um, ways to help students instead of or look, look for alternatives to a police force. Thank you. Thank you, board and superintendent. My name is Isabella Baker, and I am the lead organizer for Youth Voices in Action, or VIA, which I'm sure most of you know. Um, and I'm here today to ask you to vote no to the resolution supporting the creation of a standalone police department. Given a recent lawsuit against the state of New Mexico by the Yazi and Martinez families, it was proven and the court ruled that New Mexico schools are struggling to provide a quality education for all students mm -hmm. and schools are greatly under-resourced and underfunded. At this time, APS is the largest school district in the state and should not prioritize resources, including funding, time, and energy, to creating its own police department, but instead should be focusing on working to close the achievement gap and providing quality education that our students are being deprived of but greatly deserve. The district is so underfunded that schools lack basic, basic needs such as counselors, social workers, small class sizes, drinkable water, and other basic services that our students have voiced to us and have been proven to and that those services are proven um, to improve student success. The district should focus on having resources necessary to educate our children and not creating a police department. Students that I work with have named many other options for school safety that don't criminalize them and better positively affect them and their education, such as more school counselors, social workers, restorative justice practices, and self-care slash mental health rooms. APS is in the business of educating students and youth not running a police department. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Uh, that concludes the public forum. Thank you. Uh, we're going to the superintendent's report. Superintendent Reedy. Thank you, uh, President Piercy, board members, community members, and staff. The students at Hawthorne Elementary School are doing something different with their announcements each day and I'm going to join them next week because it looks like so much fun. Um, they're creating video announcements as a newscast called Dragon News. So let's check out a recent Dragon News. Good morning, Hawthorne Dragons. Today's day is Friday, August 31st, 2018. It is also not National Eat Outside Day. Let's check with Mia before we eat outside. Now over to Mia in weather. <laughs> Thank you, Avera. Today we expect hot weather. The temperature will be 90 degrees Fahrenheit today. We will see mostly sunny skies. There will be 
chance of rain today. Back over to you, Eric. Thank you, Mia. Today for lunch, we are having four cheese enchiladas. Thank Make sure you say thank you to our cafeteria staff today. We don't have school on Monday. Miss Martin has an important message for the Hawthorne Dragons. Welcome, Miss Martin. I heard you have a special message for us today. Well, thank you. Yes, I do. I have a special message. All of you have had a report card, correct? We get a report card every year, a couple times of a year, right? Well, see, our school gets report cards too. And for the past six years, this is what our report card has looked like. Can, am I showing that correctly? What is that? What is that? A big fat what? F. F. That's what our report card looked like last year, the year before, the year before, the year before, the year before, and the year before. It's a lot of years, isn't it? <laughs> so yesterday, guess what I got? I got our new report card. And look what it says. <laughs> isn't that something? I'm, yes, I am so proud of this. See the big C? This is the big F. <laughs> So I'm so proud of this. And once again, you students did this. And I thank you so much. And your teachers last year prepared you, but you did the work. So congratulations. And I just wanted to share it with you because I just got it right off the press. Thank you for being on the Dragon News. You're welcome. Thank you, Miss Martin. Remember Dragon News. It's cool to be smart, but it's even cooler to be smart and kind. And I'm with Project Coyote, and what I do is I teach people how to respect coyotes and why we need them. And this is Rowdy. Rowdy used to be a decoy dog for coyotes and chase them, but he was rescued by me, and he lives with me now. And we go and visit kids and tell them all about Rowdy and why coyotes are important for the environment. Cute. They sounded a lot like the board when they say the pledge. When you guys say the pledge, I, I, it just brought back memories. Um, one of the things, uh, I, I don't know if I should be the weather girl or if I should play with Rowdy. I, you know, perhaps you can help me with that difficult decision. We had 30 students from Albuquerque Public Schools who have been named 2019 National Merit Scholarship semifinalists. These high school seniors are among approximately 16,000 semifinalists chosen from more than 1.6 million students who entered the program across the United States. The nationwide uh, pool of semifinalists represents less than 1% of U.S. high school seniors. And more than 90% of the semifinalists are expected to attain finalist standing, and about half of those finalists will win a National Merit Scholarship. We're very proud of our students. Gordon Burnell um, Charter School recently held a groundbreaking ceremony at their new school site. There is a picture posted of the ceremony on the screens. From left to right, it includes um, Gordon Burnell founder, Greta Roscom, 
Executive Director Kimberly Peña Hansen, and Board Members Jerry Otero and Eric Bose. The location for the new school is North 4th between Candelaria and Manal. Gordon Burnell Charter School opened 11 years ago, it seems like yesterday, and the program has been emulated in districts across the nation. We can all remember at least one staff or faculty member when we were students in school that made a difference in our lives. If you have been mentored in your career in, in the Albuquerque Public Schools by an individual, please consider nominating them for the APS Hall of Honor. Nominations are due before October 31st, so I really want to encourage everyone to think back, and I know that you can name several individuals that, that uh, are deserving uh, of this honor. On September the 13th, 2018, the Mid-Region Council of Governments gave out their annual public partnership awards. This award is given to successful partnerships that make a difference in the lives of children and or adults. The APS Student Family and Community Supports Division and School Police Force the Bernalillo County Sheriff's Office, the Bernalillo County Fire Department, Albuquerque Police Department, and Albuquerque Fire and Rescue were awarded the, the partnership award for our, what we call, Handle with Care initiative. This initiative was designed to help schools be responsive to children who have witnessed or experienced a traumatic event. We respect privacy and so at no time is the information about the event shared with schools. They just know to keep an eye on a student with, and to handle them uh, with care. That's all we need to know. This program has been very, very successful. And from October 2017 to today, we have had 211 Handle With Care students. And I want to share with you this lovely plaque that we got, um, and I'm not sure where we're gonna put it. I think that I'll take it with me, uh, <laughs> unless somebody else wants it. Maybe we'll, we'll just kind of pass it around to different departments, because it really says, it says here, presented to the Albuquerque Public Schools 2018 Public Partnership Award for the Handle with Care Initiative. We're very proud of this. This has been a very successful program for us. As you know, the community school movement has grown across the country and internationally with more than 5,000 schools, 31 right here in APS, with 23 full-time community school coordinators. Community school coordinators are the people who push forward this movement and are the key to successful implementation at our schools. Community school coordinators work diligently to create and manage the partnerships that allow students to learn and thrive, and they deserve recognition for all the work that they do. In fact, just this morning, we were talking to a group of business individuals um, who are very involved with APS, and we were talking about the community uh, school movement. We need to talk more and more about it because it is making such an impact in the lives of our students. Next week, September 25th through the 29th, is National Community School Coordinators Appreciation Week. We would like to invite you to celebrate our community school coordinators. Our community school coordinators build relationships between schools and community partners to support families and help students succeed. Coordinators are invaluable and we thank them we thank them for all their hard work to ensure each student learns and thrives. So please join us in celebrating our community school coordinators that week. Finally, I want to extend a few shout outs to three executive directors in the finance department who hold official positions with outside professional organizations related to their positions. Uh, ben Lucapent. Loop. Ben Lupkeman, I like that. Ben Lupkeman, 
Uh, executive Director of Accounting is an active member of the Urban School Executive Leadership Institute at the Council of Great City Schools. That's nice. Ben has only been with us a couple of years, right, at most, and here he is already representing us at the um, Great City Schools, the Council of Great City Schools. It's, that's wonderful to hear. Teresa Scott, our own Teresa Scott, Executive Director of Budget and Strategic Planning, is on the Board of Directors for Region 3 of the New Mexico Association of School Business Officials. And then Renette uh, Apodaca, Executive Director of Procurement and Business Systems, is the president of the New Mexico Public, Public Procurement Association. This speaks highly of both the credentials and leadership capabilities of these staff, staff members and what they bring to the district. Talk about high caliber professionals like so many others that we have all over APS. I'm very thankful for both the work of these staff members and what they do and the ways they represent Albuquerque Public Schools in their professional organizations. That concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Reedy. We'll go on to special issues. The first one is consideration for approval to nominate an Albuquerque Public School board member to serve as a representative of the board on the APS calendar committee and request for suggestions of parents to participate. It's a discussion, Ashton, Todd. So good evening, uh, Dr. Piercy, members of the board, Superintendent Reedy. This is part of our uh, annual recruiting request for a shiny happy face from the board to sit on our prestigious <laughs> steering committee. Um, and with that, we'll uh, look for a, a nomination and any community members as well. And with that, we'll stand for any questions you guys might have. <laughs> okay, board members. I, I mean, I've done it for the last four years, so if somebody wants to do it, they're... Do you have food? And... Oh, for you? The world. No. Yes. <laughs> What's the time commitment? I think you have like four meetings. Probably about three or four meetings. Yeah, right, Peggy? About four. About four, yeah. about an hour, yeah. And this calendar, this calendar will be simpler than we thought. What do you think, Yolanda? <laughs> I'll volunteer. Rock, rock, paper, scissors. Okay, we have a volunteer from Elizabeth. Is that okay with everybody? I move to second the motion. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Sorry. Who, who moved? Snyder, right away. Okay. Make, make Candelaria's the motion, and I'll second her motion. Okay, Candelaria makes the motion. <laughs> Barbara seconds it. Okay. Now, is that okay with you, Peggy? I mean, you've been, a, been our steadfast person over there, you know. Everybody. I've done it. I've done it for four years. I know you so have. 15, 16, 17, 18. No, you're you're very well, experienced. I, I know. It's it's not. It's okay. yeah, I mean, it, it isn't that easy. Yeah, it is. Really, because you have to listen to the parents and the teachers and administrators <laughs> and the kids. I heard a nomination. I think. And careful, really careful. <laughs> you better run the right nomination right out. Them. President Piercy, could we vote right away, please? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think we're getting a. Where are we going with that, right? Yeah. Uh, Okay, well, we've had a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor of uh, Board Member uh, Elizabeth Armijo being our representative on the calendar committee. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, you've got it, sweet one. All righty. Good. Thank you so much. That was easy. Okay. Uh, we're going to the consideration for the resolutions submitted to the Mexico School Board Associations. We have several of the resolutions. And what I want to do is I want to go through each one separately. We'll vote on each one separately, uh, even though it, it doesn't say necessarily we're going to do that separately. Um, and so uh, I think we all had these resolutions in our packet. So let me go in the order they were in our packet, see if I can get to that order here. Um, and I do hope that everybody who spoke here will be able to stay around and listen. Uh, I think you may hear a little bit more about what some of these resolutions mean. And uh, hopefully they, they may clarify some issues that you have brought up. Because I think sometimes we don't understand all of the things that we're trying to do here. So that'll help maybe a little bit. So the first one here is... Um, is the resolution for funding on uh, instructional materials. That's what we have in our bag first. Is that everybody got that? Mm -hmm. 
Are there any comments on this particular resolution? Any possible changes? Uh, any thoughts on it? Uh, Board Member Muller Agon? On the one, two, three, four, five, six, on the seventh, whereas? So I'm gonna read it out loud because then that way you sure. can tell me what, what you think, Heather. Whereas the state approved adoption process managed by PED no longer funds full implementation causing APS to get further behind in funding cycles and or no longer be able to purchase approved textbooks. So I think we're missing an is, right? After or and or is no longer able to purchase approved is textbooks, able. right? And then take out the B. Does that sound? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and then on the next, on the next whereas, um, where it says the demand for instructional materials does not decline, now, nor the cost of the materials decrease, that costs keep going up, but the demand for instructional materials. Wouldn't it decline based on enrollment, though? I, I Just a question. I, I think it's more a matter of that instruction and materials are demanded, not necessarily how much, how many materials. Is, is that the idea? Is that what you, okay. I think they'd say just the demand to have instruction. And I thought it could go yeah, sure. both ways, so sure. that's. Um, and then when you're talking about on the first, now therefore, be it resolved, when you're talking about the New Mexico, um, that sufficiency net levels needed to equitably fund instructional materials as per New Mexico law. So what, what law are you referring to there? The New Mexico instructional materials law? That's correct. Okay. Um, and then I'm just like equitably fund I just don't know if that's like part of the lawsuit that's already been like s already been settled. Or are you talking about something separate from equitable funding? So I think it's a reference to sufficiency in terms of instructional materials, but more because the instructional materials set an allocation for students, and if the um, state distribution is underfunded then the result is inequitable because schools use or not use their operational or supplemental funding to cover it then. So it kind of results in an inequitable situation. Okay, then what I would just do though, Heather, is on the New Mexico law, I would just add in the um, New Mexico instructional materials law just in there, then that way we know that that's what we're talking about and we're not Thank you. Board Member Peterson. I'll just speak in general in support of um, the resolution. I, we are not sufficiently funded. This is a line item that's it's categorical funding in the state funding formula or state budget. And so the recognition is that instructional materials are separate from operational funds and need to be sufficiently funded in that categorical line item. Yep. Board Member Garcia, yeah? Well, I was just gonna say that uh, in reference to your question, uh, Board Member mueller uh, the the point of reference is actually the state constitution, which right. calls for sufficient, adequate uh, funding. Um, and I think that's what we're trying to acknowledge, whether or not the state has decided to not do that um, is their decision. Unfortunately, we have to deal with what we have or we receive. And so um, I believe that, uh, you know, we have to ask for sufficient funding for instructional materials. Okay, other comments at all? Anybody else? Um, well, with those changes, uh, do we have a motion to approve this uh, resolution? So moved. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. Uh, we'll go on to the next resolution. And again, Heather, feel free to jump in. I'm just running through them. <laughs> um, this is the resolution I'm related to support and funding of community schools. Uh, I would like to make 
one comment, and that is that, and I think some others have made this too, is that Senator Bill Tallman, when I talked to him just briefly, he said, oh, I'd love to sponsor this as a bill in the legislature. So we may be able to work with him and maybe a, 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 another a person on the other side of the, of the, of the you know, Republican and get a bipartisan you know, support for, for the idea of community schools. And that would help, I think, a lot of other districts as well. There are other districts that are working on community schools as well. So just a little background in terms of that. Uh, that doesn't really affect our resolution per se, but I think, again, the idea that we maybe even have somebody in, in the legislature or some other people that would support us in this, I think is important because otherwise it doesn't go anywhere. You know, we don't get any funding just because we have a resolution. Uh, so just a little background there. So anybody have any comments on these? And I do have one comment, but go ahead, yes. And it's not, it, it's, it's a comment related to your your point about um, legislation around community schools. I believe there was something that was passed around community schools um, that just basically stated that, and I can't remember the year because it occurred while I was at the Department of Health, but there was some legislation that put into place or described what a community school was and talked about the elements or the components of a community school. So I'm wondering if if it needs to be, you know, it just needs to be related to that particular. It will be related to that. Okay. Yes, it will be related. So, I'm, but I'm, but should it be part of the resolution? Hmm. Uh, I don't. I can. That important. We can look up the reference to put in the first bullet point if you want to. So one of one of the, therefore, be it resolved, Is should be, to cite. And, and we can go back and find the bill. I mean, it's statute now that it, it was passed, but it doesn't include funding. Right. And so one of the line items, or one of the um, results should be to provide funding through that legislation to, to school districts. Right, and, and that's, that's what I think mm -hmm. the, the bill would focus on. Right. In fact, we already have an encouragement, so to speak, for community schools right. through that statute, but, but we don't have any funding that goes with right. it. And, uh, but, so probably look that up, and, and that would be a good one, I think, to put in the, uh, be it further resolved because of the alleged, you know, current encouragement or you know, whatever we want to say mm -hmm. right. uh, that existed already, uh, we uh, want to have sufficient funding uh, and it might be that that the that would go you know and the be, be it further resolved before the end the one before the end mm -hmm. which is a little bit redundant with the one before that actually because the one before that just says yeah we need to have it sufficiently funded uh, okay. so maybe from that point of view add that into that further resolve right right I think that works and again we gotta be a little careful because we don't know exactly what that language is. You know, I'm a little hesitant when we don't know exactly the language, but if everybody can agree that we know that that exists at the, at the legislative level, so that's kind of the mechanism we would use to say that's where the funding should come through, is that we already have something that says this is a useful uh, uh, construct within our schools. Mm -hmm. And we've used that actually as part of our community school uh, policy that, uh, that we have with the uh, Albuquerque Vernon County. We've used that. So it's, it must be in there too. I know, and, and Dr. Piercy, I know when we were, Barbara and I were at the retreat with ABC Community Schools last week, they were talking about some schools that call themselves community schools, but really aren't. And so that's also a sticking point that we need to have, every community school is gonna look different based on their neighborhood and their needs, but there has, you can't just call yourself a community school. So it's kind of, I think we were talking about trying to figure out how you really define a community school. So when you're talking about like funding, how will, and maybe Heather would know, how would they, they fund that based on whose definition of a community school? But I believe that the mm -hmm. the legislation. Because what that says would it it describes. Well, then that's what it ABC. What it was. That's what ABC should then use 
as their but definition. ABC actually helped support that legislation and write that legislation. Yeah. And it was put in there because it defined the components of a, a community school, specifically right. set to define it. Yeah. It's just the schools that are calling themselves right. community schools, not based on. Well, I think, again, part of the bill in terms of the funding aspect should clarify exactly that schools who want the kind of funding for community schools have to satisfy Those the definition, the definition requirements definition. of what we mean by community mm -hmm. school. So that's probably you know part of the bill aspect and, and how the funding would come. Uh, you know, people can call themselves whatever they want to, I guess, but the question of whether you can actually get funding for that means you have to satisfy the definition of what you mean by a community school. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a great point, but that's probably something we could put and, and pursue with regard to the, the, the bill itself. What do you think? I think there's a bit of a line that we have to walk on this because last year this the resolution for community schools was voted down by the school board association and the reason was that that many of the smaller districts saw it as something that was just an urban issue that they didn't want a structure imposed on them that that's a structure that works for us but doesn't work for them I think this year there's there's more groundwork that's been done in Las Cruces and Santa Fe. Both have active community schools or working with ABC to follow that framework. But I think in terms of getting the support from the school board association, it's it's that line of saying, yeah, this is a structure that works. We have a structure through ABC partnership that may be different from if you're in Floyd. That's an implementation. That's, it's, the implementation. it's an implementation. It's implementation, but in terms of getting the support of NMSBA, I think leaving this open and not too specific is, is important for the language of the resolution. Um, well, I think, and I think the implementation is something that we work through at the district level. Well, again, assuming this gets through the committee, which I guess it will, because they all get through kind of, but whether people will, when it comes up, we have to be willing to step up and say how that would work. Mm -hmm. In other words, it may work different for us, mm -hmm. it may work different for you, but the point being is that if you want to establish something which helps you get the community involved, helps you fund, for example, it might be a coordinator, uh, that may, that's kind of our mechanism. Uh, but the point being then is that if you follow the definition that's in the, that's in, that's in the statute, uh, then in fact, you can get funding to help you with this. Mm -hmm. So the point is you can do that whether you're a rural district or who you are. And I think they thought that this was just strictly, uh, well, that's just for you guys because we don't really need that or whatever. Well, if you don't need it, that's fine, I guess. But in reality, they, I think they do need it. I think they're, the small districts need it as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that's our point to make to a lot of our 89 districts, which are pretty small, uh, is that th this is a help for you guys too. I mean, it helps us because we've got a structure, we've got a wonderful ABC that we work with and so forth, but, but it'll help you guys actually work with your businesses and establish how it is that you can get some funding to help you with, with that, uh, that relationship. So I think we have to be ready to, to support what we want to say. But you're right, I think, Barbara, you know, if we make it too specific, like community coordinator and all this stuff, well, that's our implementation of it. And that may not be exactly what they have to do. But I think, in fact- But it does then, in here, it does say including a position. So we are imposing that on some of the smaller <laughs> rural districts. Well, right? but I think- and, and it actually is what, what we're asking for, because that's gonna- That's what we're asking. It is in, Well, that is also in the, in the, the that's in the, uh, in the legislation. It, it, it's establishing a position. Now, whether we call it a community coordinator or what we call it, that's something different. Uh, we've established some real specific things, you know, with regard to our relationship with ABC, but, but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean they have to call it that. But, but the top level, I think, has, has that, those conditions in it. So if you're gonna establish a person, well, then that means you need to fund it, you know? It's to, somebody who coordinates for you, that's what you're talking about. So Barbara, what do you think though to make it not be, you know, for the rural districts? So 
I think it's okay as it stands. Okay. Because and then it comes down to when legislation is actually developed, sitting down with legislators and looking at what the language in the existing statute is and figuring out how it, how the wording, what the form of of the funding would be that's funneled through it. But so I think it's okay as it stands. It's just not ready to be legislation yet. Well, yeah. no. I, I would and, and the funding would vary mm -hmm. depending on how many community mm -hmm. schools come in every year, too. So, of course. Yep. right? I mean, that, that could change. And yeah. we may never have 100% of the schools that want to be community schools. Sure, so. absolutely. Um, any other comments from the board members? So, so basically, we're looking at a change that would add... Uh, in the second, be it further resolved from the end, that would add a reference to the le I existing list. It's chapter, or it's 22 32 of the NMX, NMSA. Okay. Okay. So, with that addition, um, I had one other thought, and I'll, I'll run it by you all. Uh, and, and it may not be right. Uh, you know, the second, whereas from the bottom of the first page, it says, whereas community schools include extended time for learning that integrate community partnerships through designs like Genius Hour. Uh, and really what we have also done is extended the days of the school year. But that may be a little too much, you know what I mean? I don't know. Uh, I'm a pretty big believer that more time is what our, a lot of our kids need, you know. But again, that's not necessarily a community school issue, you know what I mean? They may not do a genius hour in a community school. They may not do extended days in the year. Uh, community school itself is is a specific kind of a thing. Uh, so they just said partnerships. So that's the idea: is you want partnerships. And the idea of the genius hour is good because what you're doing is having a partnership with businesses and other people coming in. So that's probably a better reference. So I'm going to re erase my thought because I I talked, I, I talked myself out of it. <laughs> Because I do want it to be related to the partnership idea, because that's the idea of the community school. So I think the genius hour is probably more suitable in that in that context. So maybe strike the extended time language and just say that community schools integrate Included. community partnerships, and just have that be. It may already be stated up above, but I think that's that's the point. What they do with it is based on the needs of a particular school. So, so you would say include time for learning that integrate community partnerships? Yes. And then just take through designs like out of there? Mm, but I think, it's, I I think like one it. of the major characteristics of a community school is that extended time. Because yeah. it is it is a characteristic of a community yeah. school. Yeah. I, um, I think the I think the extended time is okay. You might want to take the through designs like the Genius Hour. That make it sound a little bit too much yeah, like us. Too so you say community schools include extended time for learning that integrate community partnerships. And that is part of it, you know, because when we have uh, internships, when we have, uh, you know, uh, those kind of things, those are extended time usually, right? Mm -hmm. So. And you can, I mean, you can. Um, that extended time could look in various ways, but it is a major characteristic of a community school. Right. Okay, so so the, the, the other change would be then for that one to say, whereas community schools include extended time for learning that integrate community partnerships and then period. Mm -hmm. Leave out the design. Got it. Genius Hour. Even though I love that. I mean, I think the Genius Hour is a great thing, but if we wanted to explain it to somebody as to here are ways you might implement it, that's, that's certainly an implementation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that one plus the other one on the other side uh, with the adding the reference that you mentioned. Okay, any other comments? Uh, no. I move for approval. Okay, we got a move, motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, thank you. Okay, um, the next resolution is related to exemption of all but final candidates for superintendent positions. Um, and I have talked with a person named Nick Estes. He may have talked to some of you too, I don't know, who is a lawyer, a kind of a local lawyer who actually has a broader bill about all public organizations in terms of the ability to 
say that only for finalists would you actually do that because people, uh, generally speaking, have a, you know, they may be very well uh, uh, happy where they are, but they're looking to maybe, you know, get advancement or whatever. Uh, and they may not be a finalist, uh, you know, but they want to find out about it. In fact, sometimes it's a matter of a learning process. You know, in other words, let me send my resume out, and then if I'm not selected, uh, tell me exactly what I need to do to do better here, right? And they don't want that to be necessarily a public thing because that may, may make it difficult for them back home where they are. Um, so the idea on this is only for superintendents for us. In other words, the idea being is if we have a search for superintendents, uh, we get 40 people who put in applications. Uh, we would vet all that and then finally come up with some finalists. And once we come up with finalists, those people and their resumes and so forth would be public knowledge. And we would probably have just like we have open forums and everything else. Everybody would know everything about those people. Uh, but until they're finalists, the question was, is that really right for people who, who you know, might actually have repercussions from even making a, an, an application. So that's kind of the idea here. Uh, so where did the, Dave, where did they come up with the five? Well, that's, that yeah, and I asked, I, I, I asked that down there, um, and, and actually, I don't know where the, we came up with five because the one that Nick had says at least three finalists. That was the language that he had in his and that came from states that already have them. We have 35 states who already have this in their language. And the language is typically the final three, uh, three finalists. In other words, if you only have two finalists, uh, I guess you only have two finalists, but usually it's at least three finalists. That means if you have at least three candidates, you need to call them finalists. So if it's you have, not like based on the size of a district. Like I'm thinking, no. what, what is it at UNM, at some of the colleges, what, how many? Well, New Mexico doesn't have anything. Right now, New Mexico is one of those states that you have to uh, disclose everybody. We're one of seven states that has that, okay? There are 35 states that have only the requirement that you have at least three finalists, and there are actually 15 of those states, I think, that have no requirement for any finalists. In other words, only the person you have. So what we're trying to do is to kind of get in line with the 35 states who say it's only the, la the final three. So it would, what it would be is, well, we're just a resolution here, you know, obviously. You know, we don't affect anything. But the idea would be is if you, if you establish a change to the IPRA, the public records, you could only do that for the finalists. And then there's the three finalists. That's, that's the idea. And so what they're trying to do is to, to look at this from a, broader perspective than just superintendents, but any top executive of public uh, organizations would serve in this same, kind of, this same kind of an idea. So that's kind of a little background that I know. And I was surprised to know that 35 states mm -hmm. already have on the books laws in terms of the IPRA that you can't uh, get their requests for anybody but at least three finalists. I was surprised to see that there were that many. Uh, so it's not like we're setting the standard here at all. We're just kind of going along with 35 states that already have, have set that standard. So whether we want to do that or not, that's up to the board, you know. I personally thought it was a good idea just from the point of view that, you know, people who want to apply and understand how the application process goes, they may not think that they're good enough to do it. Maybe they think they are, you know. Uh, <laughs> but we want to have a pool of the candidates that we really do believe would, would enable us to have the best candidate. And if people are afraid to do that, and you only get people who are just not, are just willing to go ahead and apply no matter what, uh, then we may not get the best candidates. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, that kind of a thing. Uh, so that's kind of the idea here, you know. So uh, I did have the one change. Uh, one is uh, list five candidates, and I said at least three finalist candidates. You know, I, I didn't like the five because that didn't go along with what I understood uh, Nick has, has told me about what the other 35 states were having. Um, and and, and it, uh, Members of the board, um, we can change that both five to three. I, I picked five because that was the University of New Mexico's exemption in the, the act was they only have to disclose when they get to the bottom five. I, I don't know that they have any way to do that they, right they now. Did. They did. Um, Recently, I don't, I don't, I didn't. Well, they may that. have done it, but I don't think that's in state 
law. It was a court case that allowed them to exempt the last suit, their last case. Okay. Last okay. Um, and do you think five is a safer number then? Just three is pretty typical with the other states and school yeah. districts that have this yeah. kind of, with the 35 states, three is the top three is pretty typical. That's pretty typical. And the other thing that I, I kind of want to remove is when it says in the very next be further resolved, it says the most qualified candidates, it says among sitting superintendents, it doesn't have to be sitting superintendents. I, I would take that out, okay. period. So those are my, my two thoughts on this one, but the others can, can, can add in some things, okay? Any, any other thoughts from others? I mean, if you want five, that's fine. You know, I don't, I don't have necessarily a really big deal on that, but I would like to be able to say, well, we got 35 states out there, and this is what they do, you know, instead of, well, there's 35 states, but we're different, so we're going to have five. Okay, you know. I just hope it's something we don't have to deal with for a long time. <laughs> well, that, that's another thing. That's another thing that we're dealing, we're, we're saying. But you know. mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, I think you know the concern of the community is that the, that there be a real opportunity for transparency and, and input in conversation. It's again, it's that the ideal with the reality sometimes is in conflict with each other. And the reality is that highly qualified people are sometimes not willing to even throw their hat in the ring mm -hmm. because, because of the situation that having their name published in the newspaper puts them in. So I think that, I mean, I'm, I'm in support of this because I think this mirrors the reality. I think that we'll have to work very hard just like we always do when the time comes, which I hope is no time soon, but but when we when that does come up, to just guarantee that there's openness and equity and and access to to candidates once we get to that point. Yeah, I, I think I think again the transparency is important. I think that is very important. Yeah. Uh, however, it is our responsibility to hire a superintendent. It is not necessarily everybody else's responsibility, right? We're yep. the one who hire. That is, ours. that is our responsibility. So, the Constitution. independent of all that other stuff, that is our responsibility. So, if we don't do a good job, they vote us out or they do whatever they want to. But, you know, <laughs> that's kind of, you know, it's kind of our responsibility. So, um, but anyway, so those are some things. Well, yeah. On the number on the fourth, whereas, will you tell me what it is that you were striking or read it to me so that I? There's no, there's no difference there. That's not different there. It's the fifth, it's the fifth, the one down says, now therefore be it resolved. That the next one, where I changed the list to at least three finalists. But you were talking about sitting superintendents. That's the next one down. Yeah, for the results. That's the next one down, the very second to last line, where it says most qualified candidates among sitting superintendents. Dr. Pearcy, should we strike the city. among, just have it read, attracting the most qualified candidates for positions yes. in New Mexico schools? Yes, yeah. you, would, you would strike the among sitting superintendents out, because it, it may not be right. superintendent. It so. may not be a superintendent. Right, exactly. It may not. So on the, where, on the whereas, do, is that still fine on the fourth whereas to, to leave sitting superintendents on that one, or are you talking about? Well, I, th I think we say, should say, yeah, I, I, qualified candidates would be a better term. Okay. Okay. Or some some qualified candidates. <laughs> yeah, I would take sitting. I would say just discourages some qualified candidates out of there instead of saying sitting super. I mean, that's clearly one of the cat categories that we would definitely think it's discouraged, but it may discourage others too, you know. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. And so one of the reasons why it came up just just to point this out was that in our in the last superintendent search there were no sitting superintendents from from any kind of comparably yep. sized district yep. that were in that pool. And one of the reasons was because of the position it puts them in. That's right. It's, it's very difficult because if you've got a sitting superintendent someplace who puts in their candidacy, then the board over there says, oh, well, wait a minute, you're trying to leave us, so why don't you just get out of here right now? Mm -hmm. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> this is exactly what I meant to do, you know. So, yeah. 
Okay, so th those are the three changes so far. That one in the, first, in the last whereas, the next now therefore, th at least three candidates, and the next be therefore resolved, take them among sitting superintendents out. Other comments? I'll move for approval. Second. Okay, it's moved, been moved and second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, thank you. Uh, the next one is, uh, is the one on, uh, on uh, school police department. Let me, let me give a little background here because I think there's some misunderstanding of what we're doing here. First of all, uh, establishing a, our own school police department has nothing to do with adding officers. We already have SROs that work in our schools. We have CSAs that work in our schools, and those would be the same people, the same people that are in our schools. The second part of it is, is that um, right now, we do not have control of our campuses. When, we, when something happens on our campus that we have to call the police, we call the APD, we call the Bernalillo County Sheriff's Office. They take control of our campus. What we want to have with the police department is us having control of our campus. That is the idea. In other words, our SROs are trained for how to handle students. And you can see, I, I know you've got examples where they didn't work well, but they are trained basically to handle students. The APD, Burnley County Sheriff's Office have different modes, different operational modes. And I don't disagree with their modes at all. But if they come onto our campus, they use their modes. I wanna let you know that, okay? So we're not, what we're trying to say is with the police department, we can then have control of our own campuses. In other words, if anything happens on our own campus, we can control it, we can do the appropriate discipline or whatever we need to do. We don't have to call APD or the Burnley County Sheriff's Office. The third thing is funding. If we have our own police department, we can get federal funds for our police. In other words, our SROs, those people. That reduces our operational budget that we have to spend on those people. Okay, so instead of saying it's gonna cost us money, it's going to actually save us money because we can actually fund those people through federal funds, okay? So it is not costing us more money. It is in fact reducing the operational budget. So those are three things that I think are important for people to understand that I don't believe they understand. They believe that if you form a police department, that's gonna be something where we add a bunch of police, we do a bunch of stuff. Right now, our SROs are already armed on our campus. Our CSAs are not armed on our campus. They are the same people we would have if we had a police department. Our chief would be the same person we have if we have a police department. They are not added people necessarily, okay? If we have a shooting on a campus, right now we have to give that over to an APD or a Burnley County Sheriff's Office. Our security people are doing some very great things right now uh, that I can't necessarily tell you about totally, but so that it's easier to transition that. But if our own SROs are there, they know the campuses, they know the buildings, they know the students. So they can take control of any kind of a situation like that. If we have to turn it over to anybody else and not be the, the lead on that, the point on that, that's a problem for our campuses. Right now, UNM does have their own police department, okay? So this is not about getting more police control or roughing our students up or any of that kind of stuff. That is not it. In fact, what it's doing in reality is reducing that possibility. It's reducing that possibility, okay? Our, our SROs are very well instructed in restorative justice. In fact, uh, Palacio down there at, at Trisco Heritage was the one who started the restorative justice. He is an SRO for our schools. So the restorative justice, in fact, process and, and uh, emphasis was actually started by our SROs and the people that we have working in it. And that's a, a very big thing that I think is important to understand that we want all of our people who are doing this to understand about restorative justice, understand about the disciplines, understand about our kids, and our SROs do. So it's a different thing, I think, than what I'm hearing from some of the people that have spoken. And I want to make sure that's clear to you all, okay? I just, I'm just giving you, I'm giving you information, okay? And so I just want to make sure you understand that so that you understand that we're not against what you're saying at all. We, in fact, think we're helping you. We're helping you do that. We're helping with the restorative justice. We're helping with the fact that our SROs do know what they're doing in our schools. And yes, there are still incidents. We understand that. But we do not want to turn over our schools 
to the Albuquerque Police Department or the Bernalillo County Sheriff's Office if we don't have to. And we want to collaborate with those people, absolutely. In other words, if something comes off campus, on campus, we have to collaborate with them. That's absolutely true. But if somebody comes on our campus, it's our campus if we had a police department. And it's not right now. I want to let you know that. It's not right now, okay? So that's the background. And so whether we do this, another thing is that uh, one of our Hall of Fame uh, honorees here, uh, Mark Shea, who is... I think an undersheriff at Valencia was, was with APS for a long time, he's one of our Hall of Fame, uh, was very much in support of this, says yes, he says, when we've got control of our own schools, when we've got the ability to make the decisions at our school site with our kids, it's much easier for us to deal with that. It's very difficult when we have to bring other people into the picture when we do that. Uh, and he said he would be more than happy to help support us in that. Uh, if there happened to be anything in the legislation, would have to be legislated, obviously, to do that. He said he'd be more than happy to help us with that. So that's a little background. Uh, and uh, just from my own uh, uh, changes here, just to in, in do that, uh, again, at uh, the very top, when you say own police department, it would be of SROs. And down here, every time you say police officers, it would say SROs. Because that's, who, that's what we talk about. If there's a security, there's a school resource officers. The fact that they're police officers, they're already police officers. I mean, they are, that's who they are. But SROs are the people we deal with, and those are the people we train. And I want to make a distinction between APD police officers and our SROs, APS SROs. Those are, those are different, okay? So the three places where those occur, and the second whereas, third whereas, and fourth whereas, uh, and there's an and missing after the last whereas. And those are my changes. With my explanation, and I apologize for dominating this, but I had to get the background and the, and the context for this because I've heard this many, many, many times. And people don't get the full context of what it is we're trying to do. We are trying to, in fact, help this. We are trying to make it better, not make it worse. And whether people believe that or not, that's, that's, that's what it is. I don't know. I can, I can only tell you what, what we're trying to do. But I can tell you what it is right now. And what it is right now is that we don't have control of our campus. So if you don't like APD being on our campus and taking control, well, then we have to do something different. Okay? Other comments from board members? Dr. Pusey? Yes. A couple of things. Sure. I just want to let you all know that I have looked at this issue. I have held very similar views to many of you. Uh, that you expressed this evening, uh, having been someone like a, a number of us here who've gone through the APS system, uh, certainly seen uh, and experienced uh, some of the things that you talked about. But I think there is a real qualitative difference in terms of what we've got now, what Chief Gallegos has done. We've made progress over the years since I started a number of years ago uh, to be able to create an opportunity for understanding, but also an opportunity to help um, push the agenda of restorative justice. Uh, we're certainly not where we want to be, but I think we're moving closer. It's very difficult in this sense that um, so much of the world outside of APS is held around a different, uh, you know, their values are different. The framework is different. It doesn't help when you have a newspaper that uh, puts uh, young people on the front page on a regular basis or sees uh, people as uh, criminals and certain neighborhoods as criminal, uh, that's not helpful. The point I'm trying to make is that I think there is a qualitative difference and I uh, support what Dr. Piercy has said. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't have room for improvement. It doesn't mean that there won't be uh, mistakes from time to time, but I think we are consistent uh, in what we hold out as a board in terms of our expectations. And I think that the administration, uh, Chief Gallegos, uh, is someone who you would be able to approach. Um, you know, the big challenge for us is to look at data. A lot of young people who get caught up in the school to prison pipeline, in my experience, um, do it once they've left APS. Um, that's not to say that we have challenges, but if you go down and visit the school 
at the juvenile detention center, I think you'd be amazed to see what's happening there. Uh, so I think, and some, some of our uh, alternative schools, School on Wheels in particular, um, you know, Freedom High School, they've been able to help young people who are trying to sort out what it means to grow up uh, and deal with uh, life issues, crises in their lives, including discrimination. Um, you know, I, I just think uh, this is qualitatively different and it will give us a chance to move forward. So that's why I support this. Other comments? Board Member Armijo. I actually, I'm a huge supporter of restorative justice and increasing our mental health services and our counselors in our schools. But I do believe that APS Board of Education and the superintendent having oversight of these specialized trainings and mediations and interventions would increase the safety of our schools. And I have a solid belief in Chief Gallegos and his concern uh, for the well-being of all of our students. So uh, again, I would support this. Um, I have the same concerns that many of you shared tonight, but I, I do have a belief that um, us having oversight along with the superintendent of this, I would feel like our um, campuses would be safer. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Pierce. Yes, Board Member Patterson. Okay, uh, you know one of the things that I'm looking at uh, is the fact that this is a big change. This is a change that could happen, and my concern is that there has been no dialogue uh, with the community, and I really truly believe that before we embark on this and before we take any action that we have this dialogue with our community, that we listen to the community. I think some of the, some of the uh, information that we got here today uh, clearly, clearly shows that there's a true concern. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I agree, Doctor, I mean, um, uh, our chief, Gallegos, is an is, is outstanding individual. I've seen him at work. And, but we won't always have the chief Gallegos on staff. We won't always, and we have to remember that. But I, I truly believe that we need to give the, uh, the community an opportunity to dialogue about this because this is really a shift from what we currently have. I'm not real clear as to all of the things that we are asking for here. Uh, when you mean support, I mean, are these individuals getting training from the Law Enforcement Academy? I mean, it really changes the culture of APS, and I've always said that. And that's my concern, and I agree with the with the people that were here today that spoke uh, uh, very um, clearly about how they feel, and I feel like we need to go out into our, our community and listen to our community, maybe have a public forum or something. I'm not ready to vote on this. Okay, uh, just uh, not not like that. Obviously, there would be forums. There would be public input, there would be that kind of thing before any kind of a bill got through. Now, this is just a resolution to say this is kind of our thoughts about what we think we ought to go to. Uh, the thing that's interesting to me is that is that we think somehow this is going to establish something that's a lot different than what we have. And in reality, our SROs are already trained. Our SROs, in fact, they are in fact one of the top group of anybody who's trained in terms of of, of their, their duties. Uh, I'm talking about just normal police duties as well as the SRO aspects of what they do in schools. So it's not gonna change that, but uh, I do believe it is a different perspective. There's no doubt about that. In other words, the perspective is what I think we're hearing from the community. What's the perspective of what a police department means? And I think that is the kind of thing that needs to be discussed and needs to be, needs to be really communicated well as to what that means. Just what I said tonight. Now, if you believe what I said tonight, that's the kind of communication we want to have. If you don't believe what I said tonight, we need to somehow uh, uh, let people know that's what it is. And if it's, if it's something different than that, uh, then we need to make sure that that's not the case. In other words, you know, uh, as we do the discussions and we do the, 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 the concerns of the community, uh, we need to be able to explain that. We need to explain what happens in a school when we have to, in fact, give that over to APD. And I don't want to, that's not a bad mouth of APD. I want to make sure that's clear to everybody. They have a certain mode of operation that they work under. So does Bernalillo County Sheriff's Office. And they want to work under their mode of operation. That's how they work. They do not want to work under our mode of operation in general. And so we need to make sure there's a difference there 
and that we understand what that is, and that our training and everything else is appropriate for that. And it doesn't matter whether Chief Gallegos is here, it matters whether our process is right and whether we're doing that right all the time. So that's the things we do now to make, make clear, and there's no doubt that before any bill would come up, and whether it, it would pass or not, I mean, it already failed once at least, um, you know, may not go through, right? So that has to be obviously something we're gonna have to do. So I think that's, and yeah, that's the idea. So yes, Board Member Peterson. I mean, I think there are real concerns about, that are we creating another bureaucracy? What's the actual cost? There, there are many, many questions of, of what the real impact would be. To me, I think most of us up here absolutely agree with the concerns of, that, that have been brought to us around this. I mean, the fact is that nationally, police forces are becoming more and more militarized, mm -hmm. that any kind of push to, to break the, the prison, the school to prison pipeline is not be, being followed through on by this Justice Department in particular right. in local communities. So I think the question is, what do we need to do proactively to protect our students? And is taking over the police force a way of actually drawing a boundary and setting what is it that we need for our young people? What is it that we need for students in school to alter what that national push is? So, I mean, to me, this resolution is, it's permissive, it's not, it's permissive language, it's not prescriptive language, and it definitely doesn't answer how all of those things would happen. I th hopefully there are some other districts in the country that are models of what it can look like. Hopefully it does open up access to funding that we don't have access to now. So when we implement restorative justice, when we try to have more counselors, it's coming out of operational funds that maybe would be freed up. I mean, I think that this, just is one big question mark, and that it's really with the community that we can answer the question marks. Whether we, whether we start trying to pull that together before the resolution goes through or after, to me this is just a vehicle to open up the discussion, because I think we're in agreement about what's wrong. And so that's, that's kind of, that's where we are. I feel like I can vote for it because it's putting it out on the table. And we've got to have that conversation. I th whether it's better to vote it down on that basis is my only question. Mm -hmm. But I can support it. Uh, but but it's, not, it's not a done deal. We've got to have that conversation. Absolutely. I mean, I would just ask Heather, what, what kind of costs would I mean, we said if we get federal funds, that's going to save us money. So what kind of costs would there be associated with having our own independent police force? Nothing. Um, board member Mueller, Aragon, members of the board. The cost, we don't, at this point for a resolution, we're not laying out the costs. I'll just kind of a point of general observation about where we are in the agenda. All the items you're looking at are resolutions that you're, um, approving to bring to the New Mexico School Board Association mm -hmm. to have a conversation about mm -hmm. issues that school boards in the state are also talking about to open up a conversation. Um, in order for these things to move on to legislation would be a lot of work out of that conversation and to form a bill um, and pass legislation would require looking at costs. As far as um, my understanding of the process of transitioning to an APS, police force, the cost is not going to increase or decrease. It's just um, the av availability of funds would be um, a cost saving because we could apply for grants that we can't now because we're not commissioned as our own police force. Right. Yeah. So there, I mean, there really, that's, I mean, that's what I just assumed that there wasn't really going to be a cost since we already, you know, we already have the personnel, we already have vehicles, we already have you that know, would that, that would be my understanding, but remember, at this point, it's a resolution so that you can Correct. open up a conversation. And if the conversation among 
like-minded school boards in the state agrees that this is something that should move forward to frame a bill would require that kind of um, analytic work. Well, one other point too, when we had this before, because we've had this before the legislation before, uh, there was considerable uh, disagreement among the smaller districts <laughs> because they felt like, well, this is just for you large districts. And what I would like to point out actually is that this is a very, very good thing for a small district. If I got a small district up here in the Laguna, Acoma place or wherever, and it takes 30 minutes to 40 minutes for anybody in the law enforcement to get to their place, then that's too late. That's too late. But if they could actually employ somebody, call it their police department, get funding for that police department, so to speak, they could have somebody on site, service them right there, and they could actually do that right on site. So in reality, I think even for small districts, there's, it's, there's a big benefit to being, being able to do that. Right now, they can't afford to do that. They can't have somebody on site. They have to call somebody, and if anything happens, they gotta call somebody that takes 30, 40, 50 minutes an hour. And I've heard that from some of the small districts who actually finally understood, oh, I see, okay, I see what that's happening. So it's kind of that kind of a situation as well. Now there's the ability to not only have the idea we have with SROs and that, but to have small districts be able to say, I don't have to wait for an hour for somebody to come here and then, and then have them be somebody from a police department that I don't have any control over at all, uh, but I could actually hire somebody you know, my local site. So I think there's some advantages also to small districts. But I think, again, that's something that there's a discussion. That's something yeah. that needs to we be happening. We have to talk to them. We can't, you know, right. speak for them because we don't, you know, we don't know. Well, I've talked with them. But, you know, again, some of them don't agree mm -hmm. because some of them think that that's, you know, that's not something for them. And so that's okay. You know, there's, you know we're not saying you have to. This is not saying you have to form a police department. It just says if you think that's a benefit to you and you can get some advantage out of it, well, then that's, that's something for you. I mean, this is just would be taking the requisite steps to just right. create that independent police Right. It's, it's, it's saying let's have a discussion about this and let's see what we think. And, uh, and I think we learned a lot from the previous one that we had. Uh, so we've got a starting point, not necessarily just scratch, you know, blank page from what we had before. And I think we can make a better better discussion on that. Now, whether it passes or not, you know, I'm, I'm not going to die on this hill, you know. I'm just saying I think it's a good thing relative to what I've seen and what I've seen in our schools and how I think we can do better, better serve our kids, you know. And that's, and I, that's and my thought. I just thought. want to make sure, too, as Member Patterson, that we are listening to the community and it's not always like an after fact, oh, we made this decision, we're going to listen to you afterwards. I think we need to not be that board. I think we need to say you are community and kids are important and that before we do something that we listen to them. Well, yes, board member Yolanda. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm the newest one on the board, so it sounds like this has been a conversation that has been going on, so uh, I apologize for not being totally you know, I tried to do some research on where I could head on this. I think for me, um, and I agree that there's a lot of work that needs to be done mm -hmm. to be able to, to consider this because a part that just scares me, and maybe it's because I'm the new kid on the block, but the whole part that would be controlled by the Board of Education and overseen by the local superintendent because I think of, um, that's not the business we're in. So I, I, I kind of think of, you know, when, when we were doing school-based health centers, for example, there was a big push with schools that wanted to control their own school-based health center or run their own school-based health center. And we had to remind school districts, but you're not in the business of health care mm -hmm. uh, because it's very different. There's, there are some things that go on there. And while we're really lucky to have Chief Gallegos, I also am grateful that there still is a connection because I'm, I'm, my, my thought is, is as I listened to our first speaker this morning, in, I mean this afternoon in, in public forum where she was talking about um, community, you know, and the importance of the school is the hub of the community. So I also don't want to lose sight of the fact that we are part of a community and that community is also our local police departments. Um, and if, if the goal is to get back to uh, community policing and 
that piece, what's our role and function in also supporting that and making sure that we're growing that and that we're supporting it. So that's, that's just where I'm coming from because I, um, I'm new to the, to the conversation. Um, but I will tell you that that whole notion of um, the Board of Education taking on that, that responsibility to me just seems really quite daunting and scary. But um, I'm, I'm still new and um, I understand that it has a long ways to go and this is a conversation for a lot of other school districts because it's not, you know, it, I, I understand that part. Uh, but I, I would stand with um, Board Member Patterson. I don't think I'm ready to vote on this. Okay, well, let me, let me explain a little bit about that. This does not change any of our agreements with APD and Bear Lake County Sarah, other than the fact, I mean, in the sense that we work with them because they have authority outside of our schools. They always had authority outside of our schools. So we have to have collaboration. We have to have agreements with them. So that doesn't change any of that at all. It just changes what they do inside of our schools. That's what it does. And so uh, we already have authority to do whatever we do with our SROs, you know. We already have that. That's not changing any. We already do that. So uh, just to make sure you understand, you know, mm -hmm. what we have mm -hmm. and what is different and what is not different, uh, that's the idea. Uh, so again, you, you know, if we don't pass this, then we don't open the discussion. If we don't pass this, we don't open the discussion. So I'm just telling you, it won't go anywhere. Now, this will be in the same situation we have. We'll be in the same thing in terms of whatever we do in terms of our SROs. So it will not, in fact, enhance the opportunity for us to actually bring this to a larger group, which, in fact, has been discussed by other districts, by the way, too, uh, and uh, maybe set a, set a stage for saying, how do we do this? Uh, do we do this? How do we make these relationships? How do we build these collaborations? And how do we do it so that we can actually address these issues that we're talking about in terms of the, of the kids being uh, 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 put in bad situations? And, uh, uh, you know, when talking to Palacio down at, at Trisco Heritage, uh, you know, he established the, the restorative justice. He was the SR that did that, you know? Uh, that's important for us, you know? It's important to understand it's coming from us. So let's discuss that a little bit, and let's talk about what that means. But if we don't do that, then we're gonna be in the same position. I can guarantee you we will not see this again. So it's the, that's the problem we have, is that, you know, we have to decide how are we going to actually make sure that we establish a capability for us to have this discussion. If we don't, in fact, say, let's put it out there, okay? Other comments? Dr. Piercy? Yes. So maybe what we should have done is had this dialogue before this showed up on our on our packet here today. Uh, maybe we should have had this discussion, and I think we just, it's the reverse. I think we should have had this discussion, this dialogue, open this up to the community early on. I think we should have done that. I really think that was, that was, uh, that was key. And I, I, I just really believe the community should have, ha we should have had input from the community before we started or going down this path with a resolution. I, I, I certainly respect that. And then I just wanted, there's a word in here, although, you know, for those who are voting for this, there's a word in here, uh, Dr. Piercy, it says will. And if you can help me, uh, there's a word that I, I would rather see that change to shall. Where, whereas, the last whereas. I think I believe it is. Whereas, will Whereas it the ability says will to establish their own police departments will enhance districts' law enforcement efforts. It should be maybe it should be changed to shall. Oh, I think the intent is certainly there. Uh, we hope that it's it shall. Will instead of will should yeah. maybe it should be shall. Oh, well, for those who care. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's okay. I mean. If right. someone wants to shout, do those who think they would like this, uh, is the shout okay? I can't remember. I think it, I think it is. I, I think. I have it highlighted. Yeah. I don't think it's right. I mean, this is not a policy, Doug, really. This is kind of more like, you know, we think these things are going to help us, is what we're trying to say. And so the intent is to make sure that we do believe that this is the case. 
Um, so. And then, Dr. Piercy, what do you, what have you seen? What can be the legal ramifications of having our own department or yeah. negative consequences? Yeah, there can be there can be some uh, both, you know, because if we have the legal right to actually decide what we do with our students, then we also become part of the legal system. In other words, right now, what we do, if it has to become part of the legal system, we not give it to right. APD and not ours, and, and they go to jail. Right. And if we want to make decisions that say, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I think there's some things that are very strict. In other words, if you bring a weapon on campus, okay, that's, that's going to be it. But I'm talking about the different things that we seem to get into hassles about all the time. You know, the things that come into more of the, uh, we're bullying the kids, or, or the police officers are not doing right in terms of the kind of things that they're doing. I think we can have our own decision about what we do with the students. And we can get them into things like restorative justice. We don't all of a sudden say, well, this looks like this is a, maybe a felony thing. It's, a, it's an assault thing or whatever. And now all of a sudden we give it to the APD, and then they're into the criminal system. And, and, and if we can keep them out of that, I think that's a good thing. You know what I mean? Now, I think that's a positive thing. But it does put us in a legal position you know, in terms of what we do. And, and I can't speak for the legal community because I'm you know, I'm not. I'm just giving perspectives here about things that would be, like you said, uh, they, well, that could be a positive. But it could also be a negative in the sense that we have some responsibility here to actually make those decisions rather than just give them to somebody else. Now, if if our students, you know, the people who talk to us, would rather have us make that decision than an APD or a Bernalillo County Sheriff, Sheriff's Office, then maybe that's good or maybe it's not. Depends on how well we do our job. You know what I mean? And so uh, I think, again, there still is collaboration. In other words, we collaborate with the legal community all the time. We collaborate with the attorneys. We collaborate with you know, the whole criminal justice system. So it's not like we're divorcing ourselves from that independent, but, but I think there are some responsibilities that come with this. Yes, sure. absolutely. Yeah. I've, I've got a question. Is it, can I? I you may. If, 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 if you want to talk to Chief. Is, and if Gagos has been I'm, sitting back there standing patiently, probably am, saying, don't say that. <laughs> I am curious about how frequently one of our students ends up in the hands of APD based on something that's happened on campus. Uh, uh, good evening, uh, board. I'm sat back and I've listened to everybody and it, there are a lot of good points that have been brought up. In answer to your question, um, a good example is that is today. At one of our high schools, there was a student found with a knife. The other law enforcement agency on campus began to process that student to go to the D home. We stepped in and said, no, 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 we have an agreement with the DA's office, which we've done for several years now. That knife is, the, blade, the length of that blade is below three inches or less, and no one was threatened with that knife. We've made an agreement with the DA's office. Those cases wouldn't be prosecuted. However, the other agency wanted to book him because of possession of the knife. That's a small example of a lot of things that we've done to avoid sending these kids, our students, to, to jail. It just doesn't work that way. So, yes, there are a lot of concerns. Our arrests last year alone were less than five students, and that includes kids who have broken in to, to our schools and have been court ordered for arrest. A judge has signed an arrest warrant saying this child has to go to jail. Our department does not want to do that. And exactly what Dr. Piercy is saying, and in my heart, I know it's the right thing to do. I know it is. And you're right. Uh, it was mentioned that I'm not going to be here forever. I'm old, and I'll be the first to admit it. I'm, no, I'm an old guy. No, 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 no. I didn't mean that. <laughs> but I'll be the first to admit it. There are old people, and they're, but, they're different. But I think we're setting the foundation for these things to be set and the right things to happen within our district. Yep. When I first got here, kids were going to jail left and right, and the people who, who spoke before me, they're right. Kids were going to jail for things that they didn't need to go to jail for, but that doesn't happen anymore. And as long as we're here and we continue to do this and set this foundation, I'm confident these kids, our students, are not gonna go to jail, there's not gonna be that pipeline, and it's gonna be minimal. But answer to your question, it's a very, very low amount of people that we allow to go to jail. That we allow. So, right, right. When we can. So, I'm curious, 
since you've probably looked into this, I am curious what what you think the additional bureaucratic burden and financial costs would be from from what you know of I mean that's a, that's a big that. unknown I can't I can't say it's going to be exactly this amount or it's not going to be this amount all I can say is we're operating as a police department right now under the authority of the Bernalillo County Sheriff's Office so it's not like we're going to do anything different if we get uh, our own police department and we don't have to stand under them we get access to ORI to NCIC that's a huge huge gain and and I'm, I, I'm so so sincere about this that that's a big deal because all the property taken from APS right now if a school gets broken into and they steal 20 computers like the other day when we had our meeting our committee meeting and there were 20 computers missing from a school there is no way to track those that property. There's no way to put the, the serial numbers and that, that information into NCIC for other agencies when they can recover that or if they recover that where it belongs because we don't have an ORI number. That's just one of the things. If we have a lost student, we can't put that student into NCIC so that other agencies can look out for that child because we don't have an ORI number. These are just small amounts of things that we're not able to do. But right now, we're acting as a law enforcement agency right now with the budget we're given right now. If, if I could just help out a little bit. So I want to point out that some of the costs you are uh, bringing up, a lot of those costs we already incur as an operational budget because we maintain a police force. Um, we buy our own cars. We do our own training. And actually, this year, we were uh, billed by the Bernalillo County Sheriff's Department for liability insurance so for, for our officers because they're operating under their um, authority commission. So we actually pay expenses. So there will be, as far as costs, we can do more detailed data analysis, but I need you to understand that a lot of the major costs, costs are borne by the district already. And the concept for Chief Gallegos and for the district is that we have a force that one, we've embedded in the schools, which is very, very different from a, a city or a county police force who actually don't have the manpower to embed. They wanted to embed, but they're, they're pulled out pretty much. So we rely almost solely on our police force to deal with any incident on our campus. Uh, they will not come if, if, in, unless it is an extremely serious situation. Uh, we're dealing now with the lack of transport for students who are having mental issues on campus. Uh, AFD and APD will no longer transport those students, even if they're considered a threat to themselves or other. Uh, Chief Gagos has to pick that up. So we're actually picking up more costs just naturally. So my sense is that there will, might be a few more costs that we haven't anticipated, but there will be some things that free us up in ways that we we have not been freed up for because we have been blocked by sheriffs and, and, and with well-meaning intent not not to be nasty but we've had issues um, and and you know this inner jurisdictional stuff becomes problematic sometimes it is nice when we can say this is our agreement and we do this our people on campus who know these kids dealing with these kids make the decision and there's a power to that. Dr. Christie. Yes, Board Member Garcia. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. You might want to stay around. I just want to uh, sort of underscore one of the things that Chief Gallegos alluded to. Is in, in a couple of schools, we have a situation where we have um, officers from other departments. And there is a marked difference in attitude and a marked difference in practice in terms of what's happened. I've Absolutely. experienced this in my own family. Uh, and uh, I didn't like what I heard. Part of our challenge, I think, is, is the function of police departments generally has gotten more and more aggressive mm -hmm. uh, around the country, and if you're a young person of the global majority or a young person of color, uh, you definitely uh, have to make sure that uh, you've had that talk and that you talk yourself into uh, trying to figure out how you're going to relate to folks. 
Um, you know, it's no accident. There have been many, many situations here in this town uh, within uh, the community where uh, it's these young people that get targeted. I, I almost think that if we intend to establish a Department of Restorative Justice or law enforcement in that respect, that communicates something completely different. Mm -hmm. These are young people who are growing up, and we've had some situations that have been mishandled. This is all part of a huge learning, not official learning in terms of what gets taught in the classroom, should be, but what gets taught in terms of organizational culture. And our organizational culture has to continue to shift, and not everybody agrees. And you know it, and I know it, that there are people who would do things the exact opposite of you who are good people, but um, they just happen to see the world different. And the challenge is, how do we begin to work towards uh, finding common ground and then begin to leverage that common ground into something different? And I think that's what has happened with Chief Gallegos. Uh, his predecessors worked in that direction as well. They understood that it was different what they were doing. I think we're going to move forward, but we want to – I agree with you, Candy. I, I think we do have to have this dialogue. It's unfortunate the way these things come up. You know, there aren't always time – always the time that we would like to have the dialogue. Uh, and to organize it, that's a whole other big thing, but perhaps there's a way that we could begin to partner. Um, there have been a number of initiatives to try to get student input and hear from students what it's like. Unfortunately, it always boils down to having input from the kids who uh, aren't having problems or challenges. Mm -hmm. And we have to figure out how to incorporate those voices of those who are having challenges. I think we have a fine staff. I, I think that there's still always room for improvement. It just depends on the situation. But anyway, that's my two more cents. Um. I did have, uh, based on, I remember uh, Yolanda. <laughs> I got Yolanda out pretty well. I have to I have to think <laughs> about the hyphen. Cordova, uh, Cordova yeah, Montoya, Cordova. Um, uh, you know that the original statement it says controlled by the Board of Education, overseen by the local superintendent. I would like to take the control by Board of Education out of there, because in reality we do not have that that role. Really, it's the superintendent's role because you're a department, you have a superintendent's role, right? So I don't think that we have right. a direct a direct role that way. So uh, whatever we vote on, I would suggest taking that out of there. Uh, and then the other things, we're replacing police officers with SROs, taking the wheel down here in the warehouse to say shall, and no, adding... No, she, no, 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 she it's, it it's actually... Oh, you didn't uh, want the, to. Where, the third warehouse will focus that it says, says may focus. Right may now. focus. I, I, that should be shall focus. I mean, that's my mm -hmm. recommendation. Shall the focus. Third, whereas. It says school police may focus on mediation and intervention. Oh, shall. Well, shall. Yeah, I like that. That's absolutely what we want them to do. Absolutely. Strengthens that. Absolutely. I like that a lot. So that's, I, that's why I was wondering about the other one. I didn't know how the will and the shall <laughs> made a difference. I like that. That's very good, Candy. So even if you vote against it, I like your, I like your change. That's fine. <laughs> I know. Well, well qualifier making sure there. it got in there. Yeah. <laughs> way. No problem. Yeah. Well, so, so that in that third, whereas it would be school resource officers shall focus on mediation, that kind of thing. Okay. And Heather, I have another question. Um, in the other um, states that do have their own police departments. How are their police departments controlled? Who controls them? Are they controlled by the board, their board or whatever, or are they controlled by the superintendent? I think that's important to know what the other 35 states do. Board member uh, Mueller, I do not know. I do not know who actually uh, controls the department. I know they have a chief mm -hmm. and the chief runs the department and of course the chief has to have a boss and I don't know who that would be the next step that would be. Do you know how it works at the University of New Mexico? Who controls their police department? Is it the Board of Regents or is it the president? It's, it's the president. I, I, you, you're correct. I believe it's the president. I think it's president. We're not sure though. Board of Regents again doesn't have that role. It, I, I just want to say that it's unfortunate, uh, Chief Gallegos, that 
our community hasn't had the opportunity to listen to um, some of the some of the work that you do. I think that's important. I think that dialogue needs to go out to the community. You know, here we are before the board with this information. That's um, it's great information, but our community doesn't know that. I and, and I agree, but I think the 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 people or the part of the community that has the biggest concern, besides of course the young people who spoke earlier, and, and I und I totally understand what the young people said earlier, and I would love to sit down and listen to those issues because it's only going to make us stronger. But the bigger part of the community that I feel has the biggest concern are the parents of our students. Yes, They're the ones who are concerned about their safety when they walk out the door until they get home. Right. And that's been expressed to me by many, many parents. Our community, thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, sir. So, okay. I mean, I think our path forward, regardless of this resolution, is that we have, that we have the dialogue it, because the bottom line is how do we keep our students safe and there's a level of mistrust mm -hmm. that's been earned not by not specifically by our officers by and large but it's but it exists and if we don't figure out how to address that and and make sure that that's not that control is not the focus of what happens when kids walk in the door that it really is education that's the focus and so, I mean, I, I think the one reason, and I'm, and I'm waffling because there's compelling reason to not support the resolution, but I also think that regardless of this resolution, the conversation and the next step is exactly the same. Yep. That, that this doesn't mean that any action is taken. It means that there may be compelling reasons to move forward or there may be compelling reasons to not move forward without this without the statutory permission then regardless of what we decide as a community we can't take action on you know depending on what that action is so i so i don't think it changes what what we have to do regardless of how of how we vote on this resolution yeah, I think so, and, and actually there's a really bigger picture here, and the students, uh, I don't know if they're students or young people, probably both, uh, but you brought up the issue of there are a lot of other security concerns, other things that are being done, or things that can be done, and I think that's part of the discussion as well, what are we doing? And so I think there's a lot of other things that the community really needs to have input on and, and information about, right? Now, I don't think they understand about what a lot of things we're doing. And so I think that's a broader discussion as well. In other words, how do we really uh, hope that we can do some of the things that, that I know that, that, uh, that uh, our capital folks and, uh, and CEO Scott Elder are working on right now to, ha to make this facilitating in terms of a lot of things, not just this kind of thing, but how do, the, how do the SROs work into this? How, do they, how are they part of this whole idea? And, and so that whole big discussion needs to happen as well as part of this, see? So I think, again, uh, I'm, I'm big about having that discussion because uh, the people need to understand, in particular our parents need to understand, you know, what are you doing for our students? You know, what, what exactly are you doing? And by the way, I'd like to know how SROs are supposed to work. In other words, tell me what kind of training these guys are getting. Tell me exactly how we're supposed to. For example, are SROs working with counselors? Yes, they are working with counselors. They're working with all the people, the, the psychologists, the people in school, to try to understand what our kids are doing there. What are the problems? What are the issues? They should be a resource for our students, not, not just a guy with a gun and hope you don't arrest me. That's not the point. That's not what we want to have in our schools. And so we need to be able to explain that. And we need to be able to have that be one of the messages that we want to have, right? And so that's a big discussion. That's something that people need to understand. That's where we're trying to go with this. And maybe that makes it a little more, uh, okay, part of the community now. In other words, the community can now say, oh, I see how maybe I can be involved in this a little bit, right? Instead of thinking of them as, boy, I hope I, hope I don't run into... That guy with a gun, you know, or something, you're right. Uh, in other words, you ought to be welcome. You ought to, you ought to welcome coming and talking to these guys, you know, or the gals that are, that are on the force. Uh, and so that's the, that's the bottom line where we want to get to, but we do need to have that discussion. I think that's right. Uh, this is a part of it. This is a part of it. Uh, it may or may not go anywhere, uh, but I think, again, 
we could certainly make that part of the bigger discussion, you know, that, that we obviously will have as we talk more and more about school safety and school security and that kind of things. Um, okay, so right now, what I have is a resolution in front of us that takes out the control by Board of Education and on the front, big, big capital letters, <laughs> uh, replaces police officers with SROs. Mm -hmm. And the third where as down below it says SROs shall focus on mediation. And that, and there's an and missing after the last whereas, I think. Yep, and just let me clarify on the, therefore be it resolved, that statement, um, creating an independent police department that would be, what did you, you want to district controlled? Do you want to just replace with overseen by the local board of education? Where, where, where are we talking so about? Now, therefore, oh, I would take that out down there as well. That first, therefore, it says the police department that would be, uh, would that, that would be overseen, take control by the board of education out of there, and so it would it would be would be overseen by the local superintendent. Okay. I have marked all the changes then. Okay. You now whether we pass or not, that's right. up to the board. <laughs> okay. Do we have any more discussion? And and I wanted I want to thank greatly for you all staying around. Thank you very, very much for staying around and hearing this discussion. Whether you like it or don't like it, that's okay. But I appreciate greatly that you stood around and heard it. Some don't do that. Some come and they give us a statement and then they leave and then they don't hear what we have to say. So thank you very much. Appreciate that. And, and I guarantee you, if you want to talk to the Chief Gallegos about this, he's more than willing to talk to you. He is very accommodating and he is not judgmental. He's more than willing to, to talk to you about the issues and what the things are. And, and he'll bring that to us too, okay? So thank you very much. Okay. Um, do you want to you want to take a roll call on this? Yes. Let's take a roll call vote on this. That way, it makes it really clear what we're doing. Okay. So, can I have a roll call vote on this, um, Megan? Peggy Miller Aragon. Um. <laughs> I'm with you. Yikes. I mean, I I just think there's some things that just aren't aren't answered. So I'm gonna have to go no. Arthur Peterson. <laughs> Jeez, we got a bunch I, of awfully people here, you know. It's either yeah. yes or no, guys. We yeah. had the discussion. You can do it. It's okay. It's tough. I actually, I mean, I think there are compelling reasons for voting yes. And I think there are things that have come up that that we have been unable to even consider because we're prohibited from doing this. But I also, as I sit here, and if, and if it passes, I will happily present it since I'm on the NMSBA um, board. I will, with, with, you know, I will represent the board happily because I think there are compelling reasons to not, I think there's a level of distrust yes, in the community. Well, we can't do that, Dave, we have to make comments. Um, I think there's a level of distrust that by passing this, we, we feed into rather than explain. And, and so I think there's groundwork. I think there's groundwork that needs to be done before I vote yes, even though I think ultimately it's the right thing to do. I think that we can take control. I'm worried about what some other districts and other parts of the state would see it as an opening to if they haven't done some groundwork on restorative justice. So I'm, I'm all for pursuing it, but I'm gonna vote no for this resolution. <coughs> but I think we need to, to not drop it make sure it comes up in community settings and that we really pursue how are we going to protect our students because that's what it comes down to. So it's no. Lorenzo Garcia? Yes. Yolanda Montoya Cordova? 
Um, I'm also a no. Candelaria Patterson? Definitely no. Elizabeth Armijo? Yes, for the reasons I stated earlier, and also I look forward to the opportunity of opening up public dialogue around this and having more community conversations like we discussed many months ago when we talked about an earlier resolution. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Dr. David Piercy. Uh, yes. And so with that, it's a 3-4 vote. It's no. So they will not go on. We're going to go on to the resolution for school safety. And uh, comments from the board. I mean, Dr. Piercy, um, the what I had marked, I think it's a, a good resolution. The only thing I had X'd out was the one about universal background checks. Um, and if we don't want to strike that, I would, I would add to it if, if you all don't want to strike that, I would add after universal background checks on the second page, the first be it for the result on the second page, after uh, local governments to require and strengthen universal background checks, I would add on the sales of firearms for a fee or other consideration, but not the temporary transfer or loan of firearms between two individuals. I I had the same change. I said related to purchase of firearms. Yeah, it's just that for someone that has to get permission to borrow a firearm if they're, you know, going to use it Understood. to do concealed carry and just they're just Understood. loaning it, they'd have to get permission from the government all the time to be able to do that. And I think that language change kind of tracks with what a lot of the gun control groups already publicly rolled out last in August. So. And it hasn't it, the it hasn't passed this way in any legislature without you know with that exactly. verbiage. Yeah, so. and I and I had that too related to I I said which is related to the purchase of firearms, but I don't know is that the language. I just had it on the sales of firearms for a fee because you want to make sure, for a fee or other consideration because it could be like an exchange, but not the temporary. So that's not like me loaning my gun. So on the temporary that's transfer. That's why I said purchase as well. That, that a firearms, between, you know. So that, that's all I had, otherwise I thought it was, it was good. So, I mean, is it okay just to say related to the purchase of firearms, or do you like something more, because I wasn't sure exactly the language you wanted to hear, so I just wanted to make sure I understood what the language. Well, because it's not just, it's not just the purchase of firearms, but it's also just temporary, you know, temporary, a temporary loan or a temporary transfer to someone, like I say here, like I did for my daughter, it's like, you're okay, not, here. Yeah, but you're so not. I would say to strengthen universal background checks on the purchase of firearms or the temporary transfer or, or loan gift, of firearms. Or the gifting of firearms. You know, because it, like I've, I've loaned mine oh, you want to, to someone before. I, I think that sure. we have to the temporary loan of firearms and add that in there? Or the temporary uh, transfer of transfer firearms? Transfer or loan, which however. Transfer, transfer, that's kind of a transfer of firearms. You're, doing, you're not loaning, Purchase you're transferring. Purchase or transfer of firearms. I think transfer. But transfer. I don't know what it should be, transfer should be loan, because transfer is a note something different, right? Always than loan. I might be transferring it to you, but loaning is different. So I don't know if, I don't know, Heather, you have to see if both of them are, should be in there. I don't know. Transfer and loan are two different, I think they're two different meanings, right? Can you loan a firearm? You I don't be I don't know. A, a firearm, actually. You should not loan your firearm out to anyone. So, so anyway, the, the, the language would be related to the purchase or the uh, transfer transfer of firearms. I, I just say transfer, right. purchase so or transfer. How would it read, say, say it again. Okay. Uh, it says Albuquerque Public Schools calls for federal, state, and local governments to require and strengthen, universe, strengthen universal background checks related to uh, the purchase or transfer 
of firearms. Hmm. <coughs> it's a kind of an interesting is it question. Transfer of ownership. I, no, because no. it's not. Because no. what, because what a lot of people do is, back. what a lot of, I mean, I think transfer and loan are two different things. I would have both of them. I, somebody who may be taking a concealed carry, or they don't know if they want to have a gun, but they're taking a concealed carry, then you can loan somebody your firearm. Yeah, you can. It's, you, you can lo it's not against the law. You can loan them to see if they, and then they decide later. Um, or sometimes in certain shows, like, cowboy shows that they have events they do the same thing where they're just sharing their weapons. their weapons i mean it's just things that happen out there in you know in Maybe the community read so transfer and or loan transfer and or loan yeah because i think they're that's it, how you would want to write it Maybe. okay so it would, it would read like this on the purchase so related to the purchase comma transfer comma and or loan of firearms Okay. Just to, have, have you got that right, Heather? Yes, sir. Again, we haven't voted yet. We're just trying to. <laughs> I got. I know the addition. The addition. Okay. Checks related to the purchase, comma, transfer, comma, and or loan of firearms. Yeah. And again, you know, this is just a resolution. We're not, we're not creating any laws here. You know, people would have to do a lot better than we're doing here, probably, create a law. Okay. Any other comments? I've, I've got a question because this is nowhere near as strong or straightforward as what we looked at earlier this year. And we had some students coming from march for our lives mm -hmm. and and we haven't heard back from them and so i'm not sure if it alters in any way what we want to do with this resolution going to the nmsba um but i'm i'm wondering what has happened to what we tabled what we put to the side earlier this year I think it's on us to have that community dialogue that, like we discussed when yeah. we first talked about the resolution, that we have a larger community dialogue on school safety, and, and all of this falls under that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't, it, this is, it makes no reference to military style or assault style weapons. It does, you know, it's pretty general, and maybe it needs to be to, to have any kind of hope at the NMSBA for passage. But I guess I bring it up just to say I would support something stronger. But if we feel like this is the best we can do at this point in time, I'll, I'll support it. Well, they may make changes at NMSBA, who knows? Chances are, chances are. Well. Any other comments? Any other changes or thoughts? I'll entertain a motion. So move. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. Uh, we'll go on to the next resolution. I think this is the last one, right? Ooh. And this is related to the Local Election Act. <laughs> And basically, this really deals with primarily our tax levy election, the ability for us to get this changed in law so that, just, just a little background, and I've talked again with some of our folks about mm -hmm. this. Uh, this is not just this year's problem. This is a year's problem after every year for us, or every six years, or whatever it is we have elections. Because the fact is that if we don't have the election in February, we can't get it on the tax laws. Mm -hmm. We can't get it on the tax books. So we have to have a special election in February in order to do that. If we don't have one this February, we lose $30 million, okay? 
If we have it in November, we can't get it on the tax this year, and therefore we lose at least $30 million, maybe $30 plus million. So the point of this is to say, please, legislature, would you solve the problem in the legislation so that we can actually have, have support, monetary support, supposedly, for our election. In other words, we don't want to be paying both of these. In other words, for all of our board elections and other elections in, in, in uh, November as well as, as our spatial election. So just, just general. Are there any, are there any uh, specific things? I have a couple, but let me, let me just indicate uh, in the one now therefore, the first now therefore, instead of making it so specific to reimbursement to Albuquerque Public Schools, I would say any other school district to cover the cost of a special election. In other words, any school district that has to have a special election would have under this same, this same condition, okay? In other words, I don't care where it is, whether you just have one, you're going to have one special election here and you've got to have a, a tax has been made. If you don't do it in February, it won't get on the tax rolls this year. Yep. It'll be the next year. If that's what you want to do, okay, you can do that. In other words, if, if you can do that. The trouble we have is we have it in a regular, regular pattern. So it's a little diffi more difficult for us. So that was the only other thing to try to, and in fact, maybe just say reimbursement to public schools to cover the cost of a spatial election, you know, mm -hmm. period. Any public schools or something, you know, just public schools, because <clears throat> that's, or any school districts, any New Mexico school district. I don't know, because you typically are on a district basis, you know. Mm -hmm. I think school districts reads well on that one. School that's districts, better, yeah. reimbursement to school districts. Yes. I think that's better even. To cover costs, yeah. So that one uh, would read, Heather, that the New Mexico legislature provide reimbursement to school districts to cover the cost of a special election. Any other thoughts on this one? Well, um, Dr. Piercy, I know, and I've been trying to find out, and then I talked to um, Senator Ivy Soto for a long time today, so to try to go over this and get some answers, and he, is again, as I've said, more than willing to come and work with APS, do a work, I mean, just kind of, he wants to do that. Um, but we've tried to figure out when the tax property is applied and effective and nobody can, nobody can give you that answer. Nobody's gonna give you that answer. They haven't given it to him, to other lawyers, couldn't find that. The other thing that I talked to a city councilor today also, and they are going to be one suggestion to, to save, you know, to save some money, but we're investing a million dollars to get a whole bunch of money. So it's not a bad investment. It's a good investment. <laughs> you know, it is because we're getting, I mean, yeah. tens of millions of dollars. I mean, the last bond, I think it was 570 something or whatever. So investing a million dollars to even get that, it, it's worth it to our kids, it's, it's just worth it. So some things are worth the investment. Um, but they, the city, from what I understand, um, is they're going to be, um, they're going to have a city election in the spring. So I said, well, why can't we just do it together? And granted, we are, have a bigger budget that we may not be able to do it 50-50, but we could split that split that cost. So the city councilor was going to talk to um, talk to the mayor and see if that's something that we might want to look at because we could save. I mean, even if we had to put in 40 percent, you know, 60 percent, and they put in 40 percent, that wouldn't cost us a million dollars. So I just said that's 
something to put out there. I don't know, um, you know, what will come of that. Um, but then the other thing that is important is that, you know, several years from now, six years from now, this can happen again. So how are we planning to make sure that it doesn't? I mean, how are we working with well, this with this with, with House Bill 98. How are we working to make sure that we take care of this for the future? Because that is the same thing. The cities and you know other municipalities and school districts are going to have that same problem. Well, the first thing is is that uh, how we arrange our February and whether we can work with city, that's great. I think that's outside of this resolution. This resolution deals with how the legislature can fix this problem so that, in fact, in the future, we don't have this problem. And there's bound to be some discussion about that, okay? In other words, I'm not saying we have the total solution, but, but there are some things here that have to be fixed. And so I think that's, those are the things they're talking about. But certainly we got to work with Ivy City. We got to work with the legislators, and we got to figure out what kind of bill would result from this so that we can actually make sure that happens. This is just getting it started. This is just saying, Guys, we need some help here in making sure that this happens. Now, whether they'll reimburse us or not, that's up to them. But, uh, and whether we combine with the city and help that out, that's up to us to work out, and maybe that'll work, and maybe the reimbursement would be less, or, or maybe not, I don't know. But, but this resolution is primarily focused on what we're gonna try to have to do in the future so we don't have this problem. Mm -hmm. We've got the problem right now, they will not be able to pass this before we have to actually do something, probably, unless we find some way to wiggle in there. But it, it's going to be a, you know, I don't know how that's going to work. So uh, do you have some things to say, Scott? I Just very briefly, I'd, I'd like to move you all on along. But um, one is uh, we would not be able to run a joint election with the city uh, under the current law. The only waiver was for municipalities, not for school districts. So. Yep. Uh, where we, we, we wouldn't be able to we do that. We have to do our special election, and the only way we're allowed to do the special election is through right. the mail-in ballot. That's right. Now, that may change. That legislation may change, but and I'd be, I think year. we're happy to, to run whenever. We just need it done at a time so that it's aligned to the tax code. Um, remember that the issue is not so much, we have no opposition yeah. to having the election. Um, when the election is, the issue is that for the mill levy, it doesn't work in alignment with work. tax code. So either they correct the tax code or they correct when the election is held. It's, it's very simple. We met with the LFC um, and we gave them quite a bit of testimony and we're more than happy to work with Senator Ida Soto. He knows that and he's been very good about reaching out to us and, 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 and taking ideas. That's not been a problem. Uh, the other thing I would say is uh, you're absolutely correct in we're garnering $30 million in capital funds. Uh, this morning's editorial really did focus solely on the school board and it neglected the concept of the mill levy election component. So it really dropped the $30 million that we would lose. We also were talking to the business leaders this morning at the superintendent's uh, committee and she noted that the loss, they noted that the loss of $30 million of revenue and with the way price increases are going up, we may actually come back in a year having lost that revenue. And we, if we get it this year, we save the million dollars over what we would have to spend a year out. So, I mean, it's not only an investment for the 30, but it's actually a cost savings by doing it, so. Right. And it keeps us from having to change our capital master plan and everything else. So, and does this resolution, Scott, do you feel like this covers what, the, with the conversations that you've had already with the LFC, does this resolution cover what what we're asking of them and what came up? Well, it, it's just an opinion, but I believe so. Okay. Okay, so with those minor changes to the one now therefore, do we have any other comments? I move for approval. You have a second? second? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? No. Okay. All right, I think we got through that. I don't know where I am, so let me let me gather my thoughts. Uh, okay, so we are now on to the approval of consent item, but we're going to now take the item um, that Peggy gave me, which is 7CB. 
And that's the funding for the speech language services for special education. Yeah, all I wanted to do, Dr. Pierce, is see if any of my answers, anybody had answers to the questions I had at the finance meeting about the hours. I think your question was related to how many kids are served, how many hours, how many hours uh, right. uh, are provided, are by, provided yes, by provided by provo the vendors. Vendors versus the uh, maybe but the. I don't uh, see own anybody own. here, so. Probably. That would help me. Probably not, point. but. That's what I had, so. Okay. Okay, we'll vote on, I'll, I'll entertain a motion <laughs> to approve this, and, and then you can, we can vote on it. Do I have a motion? Yeah, I just got cold. I'll make Come a move. motion. Second. Motion second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? No. Thank you. Uh, we'll go on to all the other items under seven for the approval of consent items. Uh, do I have a motion for approval? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. <laughs> Been moved and second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. And we'll go on to the uh, board member comments. Have we had enough comments or you got other comments you want to make? Because they still have to go into special. I'll start down here, Board Member Miller. Again, are you are you talked out? I am. I am really, honestly, I'm talked out. The only thing I'd say is about the Dragon News. It's like when you look at those kids, that takes your breath away. I mean, they're tomorrow, and they're the ones with the ideas and 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 the hope. And so, that that was the highlight of of the night. Great. Mm -hmm. Great. Board Member Peterson. It will be great fun to have the LESC at Hawthorne next week. Yes. I am looking forward to it. Um, just one, one quick thing, and, and this has come up in several conversations lately, talking about what a wonderful thing it would be if our teachers got to have sabbaticals. That, and I think that Amanda Short's presentation tonight of just you know, we, we underestimate what intellectual activity teaching is. And the, just the total commitment and just totals, in a good, and I mean this in a good way, soul-sucking thing teaching is. <laughs> and teachers need a chance to step back and think and breathe. And right now, lots of times, we don't even come up with the money for teachers to be able to have a sub in their classroom so they can go visit a peer, a, a fellow teacher, even in the same school, even in the same grade level sometimes. And, you know, we just know that teachers get better when they can collaborate and talk. And somehow, and this is a long-range goal, but. We need, we need teachers to see teaching as a 30-year as a profession. I mean, I think every teacher gets better every year, but sometimes they need to catch their breath, step back, get some perspective. And there's a reason why universities make it possible for professors to have sabbaticals. And, and so long-term, as we think about what, what our staff needs, it would sure be a wonderful thing. Okay. Well, Member Garcia. Thank you. I just want to appreciate the board for the discussion on the resolution with regards to establishing police departments. I think it was a difficult discussion. I think it was important. And I think it's a, a good example of democracy at work. I appreciated the community's comments, the courage, um, and I think that uh, comments by Chief Gallegos as well as uh, uh, CFO Elder or, or um, whatever he is, <laughs> COO, COO Elder, sorry, um, were, were, were important. Um, the district is working together and the board is working together. We may agree to disagree and we move forward. That's a, that's a huge, mm -hmm. huge mm -hmm. difference. It's significant. So well done, everyone. Thank you. But remember uh, Yolanda Montoya Cordova. <laughs> I, was I, will, I will someday get it a little bit more clear. Okay. Um, I, I, just briefly, I really enjoyed uh, the presentation. 
from Amanda Short um, because it was it really just sort of struck a chord with me with like everything that's important about a school where she met she mentioned you know community is a part of the importance of a school but a school is the hub of the community and I think in our presentations tonight you know with uh, our communities, a focus on community schools, the handle with care piece really demonstrates that, you know, APS uh, functions well because we have partnerships, uh, because we are part of the community and our schools are part of that uh, community as well. And Hawthorne, I've always said this, I mean, you know, Hawthorne sort of embodies that, that we embrace that school because it was so important to that community. Yeah. So um, I just, I just really like that, and a shout out to the National Merit Scholars. That's always, that's always important. Thank you. Well, Member Patterson. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Reedy, for your report. It's phenomenal. All kinds of interesting things happen in our district. Um, one of the, you know, and I want to thank those, the youth were here. I believe they're all gone, but thank them for articulating their position on our, the, a resolution. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to share is in, attend in attending the NAACP uh, last Friday, one of the youth stood up in the middle of the room and made a case for uh, making a having APS make his education relevant, culturally relevant, and which speaks to ethnic studies. And he actually made a very good case in that he was a Highland High School student who was in the room, and I appreciated his comment. And then I just have um, a cu couple of announcements. No, I'm not leaving. <laughs> um, one is I, I want to make sure that our board is invited to the Tres Volcanes Community Collaborative um, grant opening celebration tomorrow at 5:30. And no, we're not in grants. You know, it's just <laughs> across the river. You know, I know Elizabeth was talking about you know having to bring lunch. We'll have Can lunch for you. Yeah, or something. But, you know, I, do, I just want to make sure that our, our board members are there uh, uh, to look at this wonderful school and the principal and their staff and what they are doing in that uh, new school. And uh, we want to share that with the entire community, the entire city of Albuquerque as well. And um, the, the other thing, I, I just wanted to uh, uh, share with you that we have our Equity and Engagement Committee meeting. Uh, it's equity, equity and Inclusion. We have uh, Ms. Melendez, the director from um, the City of Albuquerque, um, Equity and Inclusion, who does an enormous amount of work, just like our department does, uh, Ms. Ms. Serna Marmel and her staff, um, and will be here to, to do a presentation on what it is they do. And then we'll have somebody from the LGBTQ uh, uh, the executive director, I believe, Adrian Carver. And so that will be uh, next Monday at 5 o'clock, and I will see you then. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member, uh, Board Member uh, Mayo. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that it was a great NAACP Civil Rights and Diversity Conference. Uh, thanks to the board who were able to come and to all of the staff and administrators who were there as well. Um, the student from Highland High School may need a pass, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> he was incredible, and he uh, he had some great comments. Um, uh, our keynote speakers during lunch, they did an incredible job, were Janice Arnold-Jones and Deb Holland. And then during our uh, evening event was our gubernatorial forum with Michelle Lujan Grisham and Steve Pierce, where a third of the questions were on education. It was a 13-hour day for many of us in this room that attended that event, so um, thank you again. It was pretty exciting. Um, I also wanted to mention I have good news and bad news. I won't be attending the CUBE conference next week um, because my son made homecoming court and I now have to walk across the football field with him. <laughs> so, so I won't make the... <laughs> which one of those is the good part and which one is the bad part? Right. Good part is he's on homecoming court. Okay. Bad part, I'm not sure. going to the CUBE conference. So. Uh, unfortunately, because I really looked forward to that agenda, it looked incredible. So, um, and the last thing is, uh, Monica, before you leave tonight, I have a, a, a something I wanted to share with you before we go into closed session. Um, and thanks again for the folks who came out and did public comment, and thank you again for everything. Thank you very much. Um, I was going to talk a little bit in my report, but 
I've decided not to. <laughs> this is what happens when you get late at night. You know, your, your, your thought process narrows a lot. So I, uh, so I appreciate greatly all the board member comments. I appreciate the discussion. Uh, I thank you for all the people who came and spoke. I greatly appreciate your comments, Chief Gagos. I am 100% with you. Uh, and maybe someday we'll get everybody else together with that uh, because I think it's important. And I think that's the way we actually save our kids. So appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, so with that, I've announced the, the upcoming board meetings. The next Board of Education meeting will be had Wednesday, October 3rd, 2018, 5 o'clock. And the special education meeting will be held Monday, September 24th, 2018, 7.30 and the and DeLeo Martin community room. And uh, I'll consider for approval of the APS Board of Education convenient executive session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act and the NMSA 1978-1015-187 for the purpose of discussing matters pertaining to threatened litigation and attorney-client privilege related to Brian Carver versus APS. Uh, do I have a motion? No move. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, take a roll call, please. Peggy Mueller, are they gone? Yes. Barbara Peterson? Yes. Candelaria Patterson? Yes. Elizabeth Armijo? Yes. Yolanda Montoya Cordova? Yes. Lorenzo Garcia? Yes. Dr. David Piercy? Yes. Okay, guys, let's convene and see what we can do quickly. <laughs>